leg and have to wear crutches all the time. <laughs> She's already handicapped. Get a job at IHOP. <laughs> Oh. That's where, that's where the pirates get their jobs after they're back from sea. Yeah. Stop Arr. it, Sarah. I never should have invited you on. Right. Petty Potter. <laughs> Pers- Petty purse string Potter. Purse string Potter doesn't like uh, Jeremiah's furniture. We learned that tonight. We're gonna talk a lot about. There, that. Oh. there are certain things that are gone now. Let's just be real. That you've thrown out. No. No. But I would have. I don't blame you. All right. Here we go. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. I am your host, Chris Spangle. We Are Libertarians brings you all of the irreverence modern politics deserves. We explain to you what is happening in our world today and how we can fix it by thinking differently. Essentially, we make you sound smarter when you talk with your friends. Please be sure to rate and review us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, subscribe on Patreon at wearelibertarians.com. In exchange for supporting our program, we give you all kinds of bonus content and freebies. We're always taking your questions and comments via email at editor at wearelibertarians.com. If you are new to the program, we catch up for the first few minutes and then deep dive into analyzing current events and society from a libertarian perspective. This show is for adults by semi-adults, so please be warned the language is strong and offensive. With me tonight is my valiant co-host. Not sick. Greg Lenz is here. How are you, Greg? I'm doing well. I'm feeling well. You know, I'm enjoying this little cat uh, sabbatical. Yeah. This is, this is quite the pleasant surprise. Um, I was afraid the night was going to be Bittnerd. Oh, I know. You know? Oh, we'll get into that. Yeah, it turns out he, uh, I don't know. I don't know what happened. On the line, returning again, one of our favorites, Brian Nichols from the Libertarian Republic. Brian, how are you doing? I'm doing good. It's actually not a thousand degrees here in the uh, on the east coast, so I had like ninety plus degree temperatures with like seventy percent humidity. So uh, yeah, it's actually a nice cool night. So I'm not dying. Yeah. Where <laughs> now? Whereabouts in the country are you? So I'm living in uh, Philadelphia right now. Um, uh, it's, it's been di- it's been different to say the least. I'm from I'm from upstate New York originally. Um, so I mean, it's been quite a transition going down here for two years. Trump country to dirty liberal. Honestly, <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. Uh, now he's uh, he is you. You do what at the Libertarian Republic? Yeah. So I'm the associate editor um, at the Libertarian Republic. Um, you know, helping with the publications, um, and also my my main focus is our our podcast, uh, the Around the Republic podcast, which is it's been on a little bit of a hiatus uh, the past uh, few weeks on just because we are moving uh, to a new podcasting app, which will be announced soon. Um, but if you go on to a YouTube search around their public podcast, uh, you can go through, we have quite a few of uh, some pretty great interviews from back this past summer. Um, did some interviews with John Ziegler from Mediate, uh, Cliff, Mo- uh, Cliff Maloney from YAL, a uh, guy Super Mexican from uh, The Right Scoop. <laughs> um, yeah, a few others. In, in, actually, we got Jason Stapleton as well. Um, so, yeah, we have uh, quite a few interviews over there. Go check it out. Um, get to learn a lot. The whole focus on the interview series was how to uh, work together as Republicans, conservatives, and libertarians moving forward in an era of Trump. Um, so, yeah, it's good stuff. Go check it out. It's, uh, it's good. Awesome. And then also joining us is – is this your first time? No. I've no. been here before. Yeah. Go ahead, Greg. Well, I mean it's you know the one and only. It's the uh, fiancé of the boss hog of liberty. Exactly. Miss, very Miss Sarah yet. Potter. It's Not very yet. exciting to have Jeremiah Morrell's fiancé yes. here on the show. Indeed. Not yet. Wait a minute. You're telling me that Jeremiah has not proposed? He has not. He has not proposed, Sarah. No, he hasn't. I'm upset. This is a scandal of epic proportions. Scandal. What is? Why the, do you think I came to this podcast? There, I think she's defecting. Well, Listen, you know. the De- Democratic Republic of Newcastle. B-H-O-L. B- the, is B-H-O-L is a very t- 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 tyrannical regime. I mean, Boss Hog runs Newcastle with an iron fist. And so I don't blame you for escaping to the freer, better, <laughs> best Korea, <laughs> South, South, we are libertarians. So it's, it's, I'm much, I'm a dictator. But a kind of benevolent. I'm generous and thorough. In fact, you what, have cards. I have cards. It. You take this back. This is a, this is a symbol of friendship. It's a, it's a business card. That Every says, time you guys set a place setting when he comes over, I want that there. Yep, I've got 500 of them. <laughs> I, I, I don't remember if it was Joshua Loudon or, or uh, uh, Lay, uh, Laycock. I, Jordan Laycock. Jordan Laycock, yes. 
Uh, so to one of you, thank you. I, I wish I could remember right now, but I'm I'm uh, I'm at the end of my day. So Sarah Potter, you are a co-host on the on the Boss Hog of Liberty, which uh, I am being forced to. You, all right, you here. Listen, poor Sarah Potter has been sent here with instructions to read this. And listen, I want you to read it with all the enthusiasm you can muster, okay, Sarah? I if, until I get a ring. If we, <laughs> that would be me though. That would be me. Listen, if Sarah doesn't read this, she's not going to make it when she gets back. I'm just saying it's a He's, good time to use leverage when you have it. Jeremiah has alligators in his pool, and he feeds people to them. He doesn't have al alligators, but he did have frogs for a while. Well, you're ruining the bit. And fish. And now the frogs there are, are gay. fish in the pool. <laughs> now the frogs are gay, <laughs> but that's just because of Jared's dance party. <laughs> <laughs> so go ahead and read that. Okay. I don't want you to be hurt. I won't be. You will be. He's a dictator. Okay. All right, go ahead. Boss Hog of Liberty podcast is the latest hit on the We Are Libertarians network. Each week, Jeremiah Morrill and Dakota Davis explore life in Henry County, Indiana. It is a show about our circle of friends and experiences. 80% life, humor, and 20% politics. Boss Hog of Liberty is the day-to-day -day happenings of Henry County, Indiana, which is just like your community. Add them on iTunes and sample them today. Dear Leader wants you to. That last part was just false. Just so I don't get shot. I hope you make it, Sarah. I, I hope so, too. I hope you make it. Uh, now, uh, Greg, we, we have to talk. You might be getting your wish. I'm worried. Well, I'm surprisingly not. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> this is... Don't get me wrong. I don't wish poor health on anyone. But if I was, it would be Kat and Agnos. Right. Uh, Kat is sick. She's very sick. She has SARS. It's incurable. Jesus Christ. No, she didn't. <laughs> she didn't. I told her not to take in that big, you know, shipping container of Chinese <laughs> national strength effect. What did she think she'd get? I know. She has she mono. No. She, she has SARS. <laughs> There's rumors of AIDS. No, it's it's like magic. It's positive still. <laughs> I'm it's, it's, it's a controlled HIV positive. I'm the one starting the AIDS rumor, but still, <laughs> there's a rumor out there. No. I heard it on CNN. <laughs> Does she have meningitis? No, no, no she just has men that? in her bed. I mean, that's how she got the AIDS. Uh, no, she's 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 okay. She is uh, she is under the weather. She is really uh, down for the count. So she she wishes she could be here. She sends her best regards. Uh, but from please, a, from a distance, please pray for Cat. Hashtag pray for Cat. She's very ill. She's on her deathbed. And the only thing that will cure her of this illness is attention. So please give her attention. Tons of Facebook posts. <laughs> tons and tons of attention on Feed the Beast, why don't you? Twitter and Facebook, hashtag pray for cat. Oh cat, I can't wait to have you back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So enough enough shenanigans. We've had too many shenanigans already. We have a lot to talk about. It is a real it, when it rains it pours, Greg. It does. It's all at once, and you have to kind of cipher through it all and be like, "Oh, this all matters." Right? Why am I just looking at memes? I know. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's just a ton going on, and uh, we're we're uh, we're going to start with immigration. We're going to start with immigration tonight. So, yes. and we're also going to talk about the president's tax uh, framework that he introduced. We're going to do that. We're just going to give you a. a a preview. We're, next week we'll dive deep into it, but we're going to essentially give you a look at what is in the bill. But we want to spend the most of our, our evening talking about immigration tonight because it is a hot topic. Obviously, Donald Trump uh, said that he would not repeat – he would not re-sign the executive order that gave the DACA kids uh, temporary – I mean it's not temporary. So the DACA kids essentially are about the span of 15 years. And they're all younger millennials who were brought into this country and are, for all intents and purposes, American citizens. They speak English. They have no roots really to their home. It's about 800,000 uh, what I would consider Americans. And they are – they have been given – they're not going to get deported is essentially what DACA says. Yeah. And it grants them the ability to continue to work in the, and go to school in the United States. And now that they're getting older – uh, th there has to be some sort of conversation or, or law passed to give these 
so-called dreamers because of the dream act introduced by Orrin hatch uh, a path to citizenship or they have to be sent back and i think that the majority of the people in both the united states congress the white house the political world as well as most human beings i think that are looking at this look at this situation and go yeah they're americans we should give them citizenship if they if they meet the daca requirements which are you you can't have committed a crime you have to have gainful employment for a certain months you know for like basically a productive member of society exactly so. right no no criminal record you have <laughs> doing the raping it, you you cannot be one of the ones doing the <laughs> raping but somebody is doing it Somebody's doing the rape. No denying it. Mostly, there is no. Mostly white men, but let's yeah, be real. right. Oh, how original. <laughs> Blame the white man. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, listen, What's next, honey. The wage gap comment. Listen, this honey. is a patriarchy here. Okay, a proud patriarchy. Between that... you and dear leader is a glass ceiling you'll never get through. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there, Neither will I though. There is a. Maybe because I don't want to be a dictator. But... That's true. There is a gyno- There is no gynocracy. Until after you all leave. And then, <laughs> then we're going to get gynocracy as fuck. Binders of women flying in this room. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so the Dreamer kids here in, uh, in America, I mean, they produce, at the end of the last show, I basically read off some of the, the statistics, but they bring billions of revenue over the course of their stay. And that's just them, not including their parents who are here. And if they were to leave, it would cause a, a lot of havoc. And so I have wanted to have a conversation about immigration for a while, and I wanted to have our favorite open borders person, Brett Bittner, on. And so we scheduled two or three weeks ago to have little Brett Bittner on. But you know how Brett is. He podcasts at his own pace. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's got it. And I was doing him a favor. And you warned me, Greg. I tried to, I tried to warn you. You, you did nothing. <laughs> right. I Brett has a new podcast out there. It's called uh, You Can't Outrun the Fork, and it is about the keto lifestyle. Does he really? Yes, yeah. he does. This is news good to me. For well, him. Good for him. Two yeah. episodes. He keto's at his own pace. Yeah. How did you not know he has a podcast on the We Are Libertarians Network? No clue. No clue. Yeah. Oh well. <laughs> that Bittner filter on your Facebook is doing great. Yeah, I, I actually created a bookmarklet. It's it's uh, it's a it's a Google extension. If you go to the Google <laughs> extension uh, web store, you'll be able to find Never Bittner, <laughs> and it blocks Bittner from your life entirely. I wonder how many people will actually try that. I know, that's totally fake news. So what a great idea. <laughs> yes, if somebody can make a an anti Bittner Google Chrome extension for us, that would be amazing. And if you could delete him from the entire internet, I can't even begin to tell you how. You know, I'd just be grateful forever. If you are one of those so-called crackers, as Harry called <laughs> them in the last episode, please delete Bittner. But not his podcast, because his podcast – listen, Bittner defeated diabetes. Yeah. Bittner had diabetes, and he doesn't have diabetes anymore because he ketoed the shit out of it. And I, for one, am very proud of him. Go ahead, Brian. You've lost a tremendous amount of weight, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. I used to weigh 380, and um, that was about, like, 2009. And I was like, fuck this. I'm tired of weighing 380 pounds. Yeah. So I started just eating healthy and, and going to the gym. And uh, at my, my lightest, I got down to uh, 200. Um, and that was just strictly doing cardio, no, no weightlifting. Um, and then I was like, okay, well, let's, let's do weightlifting and see what happens. And then I, right now I'm up to about 265. Um, I go to the gym uh, you know, five days a week, uh, usually an hour hour and a half uh usually doing a combination of of cardio and weights um and i gotta tell you like it's it's one of the best things you can do for your body and like i i actually did keto um for i want to say like six delete months this. or so back Del- <laughs> Gre- greg, <laughs> greg physically remove button <laughs> greg is anti-health uh but well i feel like we need to be rep- you need the opposing argument right you know otherwise it'll just be too much one side <laughs> but yeah so check out brett's new podcast the uh you can't outrun the fork now i i have to be honest i'm very disappointed that he didn't come tonight it's very sad not no, not because I didn't. I wanted to see Morgan, his girlfriend. She's, Did the fork catch him? She's twenty two and hot. Couldn't quite run at his own pace. Huh? Right. You want to listen? You want to defeat diabetes and get a smoking hot twenty two year old girlfriend? Listen to you can't outrun the fork. Well, I don't know that it's not a arrangement. You can also listen to my new podcast. You can't outrun the spoon. <laughs> which, which is an, you can't outrun the poon. <laughs> right. You can't outrun the spoon, which is basically a refutation of everything Bittner says. Yes. Uh, now, so Bittner is uh, not with us tonight to uh, d- just denounce his open bordersness all over the place. So I will be taking up the slack and, and actually giving an opinion this time. 
because I do I do generally uh, ascribe to the libertarian philosophy, and it's pretty hard to be a libertarian, a, a purist, absolutely, and and exp- and try to be pro government borders, pro government force, and and. I mean, it's just—it really is hard, Greg, to say you're a libertarian and not say you're for open borders. It is, and like that's the thing is, I you know, in my libertarian society, I'm all for open borders, no government borders, free exchange, free flow of you know immigration, whatever. And there wouldn't even be immigration because you wouldn't have a government ID, right? You know, you wouldn't look at it, yeah, and like um, national from a nationalist perspective. But you know, that isn't the world we live in. I don't get to hit a reset button and say, hey. All those years of uh, learned patterns and grudges and hostility and religion and all these things that are very real, I don't just get to say, oh, I'm going to open the legs up and everybody have a go. Now, uh, Greg puts together show notes, and tonight his show notes basically, why are you against immigration? And it just basically was a screech on how his people were murdered by the white man. You only read through one part because I hadn't finished the second part. (laughs) And it's actually about how my people being – sent to uh, on a trail of tears <laughs> actually i'm conflicted on it because at the same time i it it was probably for the better for human freedom because of the creation of property rights and the way the united states implemented those in comparison to the more communal outlook of who, how anyone can possibly own the earth of my people and so it's really it's tough because i i have to accept that for liberty i had to be sent to a chain link fence place in oklahoma I mean, you're doing pretty well. You're on a podcast. It's right by God. You know, you, Spangle <laughs> says, hey, can I steal your content? Next thing you know, <laughs> sitting here next to the queen of the Boss Hog of Liberty. It's, I mean, not the queen yet, right, Sarah? Not yet. I mean, how do you feel about this no ring situation? I'm okay right now. Oh. Ask, me, ask me in a few Do you feel months. like an immigrant in a foreign land? I feel yeah. like there's pressure here. I'm, I'm all for it. I'm all for it's it. It's finally time someone boss the Boss Hog around, and uh, it's nice to have an ally and you, Sarah Potter. <laughs> and if you ever need to flee the dictatorship that is Jer- Jeremiah Morals, you flee right we here. We offer you right of return. Right. It's like it's like in uh, Mongolia. If you get caught in Mongolia, you basically are just automatically sent to South Korea if you're a North Korean. If you end up in South Korea, they automatically give you citizenship. How's that for an open border? Uh, so I want to start with uh, the libertarian purist position, okay? And... I want to just give you – this is from Jacob Hornberger, and if you don't know Jacob Hornberger, he is – he's a great resource on pure libertarian thought, and it's the uh, Future of Freedom Foundation, FFF. He has a great daily email, great blog, uh, an okay podcast. (laughs) He's he's certainly no weird libertarians uh, or around the republic, but – Jason is always or Jason. Uh Jacob Hornberger is always a great resource when it comes to what is like the what is the end destination of libertarianism. And this is from his blog in August of 25th, 2015. There is only one libertarian position on immigration the future of Freedom Foundation blog. And he writes, suppose you have two adjoining ranches, Greg. All mm-hmm. right. Let's say you and I, co-hosts, partners, It's just the two of us doing this podcast together. Cheney and Bush down at the Crawford Ranch. (laughs) Right. Don't shoot me in the face. And so (laughs) you have a ranch in Mexico because, let's be honest, you're the more ethnic of the two of us. I could get away with it. You're a little darker. Hey, pasta there, Amigo. (laughs) (laughs) And you've got a ranch right across the street, right across the border in Mexico. And I've got one in the United States like a good American. <laughs> and uh, running along the northern border of the American ranch is a, is a government-owned highway, okay? It's a 10 miles uh, ten miles from the Mexico border or whatever. All right, so one day I go down. We're, we're doing a podcast at your place because you figured out how to work the equipment. Well, it's cheaper. Right. That's where the cheap labor is. Exactly right. So I come down to your place, and we, we do a podcast at your house. And uh, so I go over, and we're hanging out for the, for the evening. Have and some quesadillas. Exactly right. And so, enter the government. All right, Potter. So, exactly. <laughs> You're Her, the government I'm in this the example. In this First example. string Potter there. Okay. Uh, Brian is the Supreme Court. Right. Claims that it has the it, that per string Potter here has the rightful right. authority to control the border and prohibit illegal entry. So to do so, it must enter on the American brother's farm in order to travel the ten miles to get to the border. So b- border enforcement essentially has to cross my ranch to get to the border to keep you out of the, of America. And it does so without a warrant, 
and it does it under the guise of the right to control the border. And essentially, if you look at it from a purist perspective, they're trespassing on my private property. Mm -hmm. The government, an illegitimate actor in this case, is crossing without my permission to come hurt my podcast co-host. I haven't signed shit like Lysander Spooner. <laughs> exactly right. And so what if I say, I don't want you on my land. Get out of here. Well, that's a problem because they will meet me with force, and you know they will meet me with force. Look at Ted Bund or Ted Bundy, uh, I, Damon or something Bundy, <laughs> the, Ivan Bundy or whatever his yeah the B Bundy Al rich. Bundy Al Bundy <laughs> and his and his sister Peg. Uh, when the government agents get to the border, they will interdict the Mexican brother who is doing nothing more than peacefully walking from his ranch onto my ranch. So let's say I forgot the SD card, which is totally possible in this scenario. <laughs> And you say, yeah, I'll walk with you over to your ranch. And we'll My go donkey's get the right here. I'll ride it right over. And hand exactly you the SD right. Card. And so I say to you, come on over to the ranch. Let's go get that SD card, and we can finish this podcast up at my place. <laughs> and uh, oh, wow, progressive. So using under a system of immigration controls, the government agents will initiate force to prevent the Mexican brother, Greg, from crossing onto his brother's ranch, mine. And if the Mexican brother proceeds to go further north in the direction of his brother's home, the government agents will initiate force against him. It's, it is a very good example, I think, of the absurdity. the absurdity absurdity of borders and the entire system that really underlines the like the use of government to justify its borders. Okay, so the actual border in and, in and of itself is a meaningless imaginary line drawn by the government, mm -hmm. and that is usually the catalyst for problems. And you know, Hornberger um, goes in, in a different article wrote libertarianism and immigration enforcement, and the problem really with b government borders are that it's the enforcement that's the issue. Mm -hmm. So the border and the enforcement of it prevents me from hiring Greg if I want to hire him. It prevents Greg from just visiting my house without going through a checkpoint, driving all the way 100 miles to go through a checkpoint with a passport to come to my house. It doesn't make any sense. So uh, he writes, under libertarian principles, I have the fundamental right to do whatever I want with my own money. That's because it's my money, my private property. I have the right to spend, invest, donate, or hoard it, or whatever. If I use my money to open a business, it's my business. It is privately owned by me under the non-aggression principle, which is that I, no one has the right. It's, it's basically it condemns the initiation of force against others and holds that people should be free to do whatever they want so as long as their conduct is peaceful. And I have the right to use my money to hire whomever I want, including someone from another country. No one, including any American citizen, a president even, has a right to force me to hire him. And that's because it's my money, my private property. I have the right to do anything I want. What the government-controlled border libertarian says is Hornberger doesn't have the right to hire whomever he wants. He has to hire whomever the government has cleared. Has cleared. So why do pro-government-controlled border libertarians, like Lenz over here, openly proclaim, proclaim support for immigration controls but always remain silent when it comes to immigration? immigration control measures. Perhaps it's because they don't want to put themselves in the position of openly supporting measures that clearly violate the libertarian non-aggression principle, including immigration raids on private homes and businesses, highway checkpoints, immigration sweeps, criminal prosecutions of Americans who harbor, transport, or employ illegal immigrants, the deportation of illegal immigrants, government-owned fences and walls built on private property through the use of eminent domain, and other measures that are characteristic of totalitarian regimes, not free societies, and instill the type of deep fear, foreboding, and suffering that is characteristic of totalitarian societies. So, Greg, mm -hmm. why do you want to build a giant wall across the border of Mexico? Because I don't live in some guy's thought experiment on an email list. Okay. I live in the real world. Like, I believe exactly like he does. I believe that any any imposition or any, what do you call it, inner, inner, um, I forget the word he used, but... Basically, anyone coming between me and you, me, the Mexican brother, you know, the rapist, <laughs> and you, the, the good – bad hombre. Yeah, yeah, the bad hombre. I, you know, I didn't go, I didn't go to our states. But uh, you, the good brother, is, is an unjust imposition since we have agreed to do vol conduct voluntary exchange. 
And so right. I am a voluntarist. I just don't live in a voluntarist world. My goal is to get there. I think the worst way of getting there is to open it up because of the way circumstances exist now. Like his, his entire premise is wrong. The premise is that you own your land. You don't. If you don't pay your property taxes, the government gives it to you. The entire concept of private property in the United States is premised upon the government owning it and granting it to someone. Mm -hmm. They have the absolute authority. And a right only exists in so much as you can defend it. You can talk all you want about it came from a creator or we gave it to ourselves, yada, yada, yada. At the end of the day, your ownership of something or your right to something only exists to the extent you can defend it from someone attacking it. And so in this, in this thought experiment, I agree. I don't want there to be any, anyone in, uh, trying to get between you know, us trying to sell goods to each other. But that isn't where I live. And so I have created – I live in a world where there is a reason why people want to come here. And because that's the case, I, I, uh, I live in, I'm lucky enough to live in a place where it's desired. And it's desired because of the creation of private property. The United States isn't perfect. It's just that it was an improvement over English common law mm-hmm. and the other status quos. And so I think that's worthy of protection because when I look around, there are very few constitutional republics that trend toward private property and the administration of those rights. I mean, look at the way uh, the Supreme Court rules over and over. Yes, they make the occasional wrong decision on eminent domain, but for the most part, it errs toward the individual and private property. And so that is why. And so if someone comes to you that doesn't have that set of beliefs, like actually my Native American aunt, lineage, you know, they believed the earth was communal. Everyone had a right to it. It was given to everybody. No one can say, oh, I'm going to divvy it up like a piece of pie, and they have the right to do that. Well, in the grand scheme of human history, borders and nation states are very – it's a very small amount of human history that has actually had the idea of borders that need defending. And if you look – I mean there has always been war over warring tribes, obviously, but you know, we've seen um, – I don't know if we've seen more, but we've certainly seen more spectacular wars right. it, over the idea of land. and It made it economies of scale. Right. Like you created these massive collisions rather than tribal inter, you know, warfare. You know, and, and I, I mean I don't want to say that like I, I want everyone to take a constitution test that wants to become an American citizen because I am pro-immigration completely. I just don't think that you should grant anyone amnesty. I think that if you want people to voluntarily associate – you sh- and you've built something worthy of value, you have the absolute it's, – it's, it can't be underestimated how important it is to make sure they believe like you because if you grant them access to change the laws and they don't believe like you, you're just waiting for a majority to decide differently. Right. Brian, what do you think about that? All right. Well, Brian, apparently, uh, Can you hear me? yeah, yep. there we go. Brian, okay, there we go. Sorry, he's man. literally shaking from my answer. He's literally, <laughs> he's, he's <laughs> uh, no, I actually, I agree with Greg. Um, hundred percent because Traitor. when it comes down to it, I mean, Two scoops. we're not, we're not in this, um, this idealistic, uh, utopia that we often will go ahead and it, we'll, we'll point at communists and socialists and say to them that we're not a, a, a utopian society either. Where you know, in in their ideal mind that their socialism and communism will work, the same thing is true with uh, libertarians. Is we can't be in this mindset that you know just because in our thought experiment it makes sense to us that others will necessarily agree um, simply because to us it makes sense. Um, so with that being said, uh, we have to look at things in a pragmatic way. And the reality is is that you know there are going to be those who will look to take advantage just because they can. Um, so. You know, going forward, do I think that uh, you know we should have a more rational discussion on immigration? Absolutely, um, but I don't think we should just say, okay, open the borders and and go you know full hundred percent open border policy. Um, I think we need to take it you know in a pragmatic, practical approach. We're not there yet. Like I'm for his end destination. We mm-hmm. just it's not time for that yet because the costs are too high. But aren't you fighting more government? I mean, you're fighting government with, in, you're enabling bigger government. I mean, you aren't fighting for more liberty. You're fighting for uh, just the same level of government, really. Maybe even more restrictions on immigration. But what's more government? But to what end? What, what's the entire idea of government in, in a libertarian? Let, let's just you know say from the non-aggression principle. What's the entire I- reason that we would even have a government? And it's to protect individuals from having their rights violated by other individuals, um, which would then go in turn with the non-aggression principle. So with that being said, for those immigrants who would seek to do harm on another individual, 
it's it's up to the government to be that that uh, vetting. mediating force, if you will. Yeah, and exactly the, vetting. Yeah, and the reason the only reason why is because you don't want Cherokee and Miami Indians clashing together. And yes, you live in a world where you're more hashtag libertarian free, but you would you rather live in that kind of state of nature where you're you have to defend everything, you have to grow your own food, yada yada yada, or would you rather live in a place where rather than you know, when someone aggresses against you, going after them with a machete, would you rather go to a justice? Uh, I, I want to argue against that, but I don't want to. I want to make sure that Sarah gets her turn but to I talk. Yes, opinion. yeah, because she's living in a foreign land and she can honestly identify with all this. I do not. Well, no, really, I I agree with both Brian and Greg. Just kind of on, you know, you do have to take a more pragmatic approach. I listen to lots of different libertarian podcasts, and some of which are like further down the spectrum where. They would ideally have, you know, no that borders. That offends me. I consider myself full spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, so just having, just going straight to open borders from what we have now is a terrible idea, I think, just because of the amount of changes that would happen. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of pieces that are already being held up just by what we have that would just fall and it would cause a lot of issues. And I'm not saying issues like, you know, who's doing the raping type issues. I'm talking about economic issues. Right. Um, so things that those people who Currency are here exchanges. spending money, um, it's paying taxes, some of them, um, those people, like we would lose all of that economic freedom for, or well, sorry, not economic freedom. We would lose all that economic impact if we, you know, just completely opened everything up to everyone all at once. Yeah. Oh, we're open for business. And then you're sitting there and saying, Oh, we're shocked that all of a sudden they got rid of the Fifth Amendment or the Fourth Amendment or the Second Amendment. Yeah. Because really everything's premised upon the Second Amendment. We have guns, so at the end of the day, worst case scenario, we can go shoot the government. But you're, you're kind of making in, – in what you were arguing a little bit ago, you're making the move to Somalia argument. that I'm not. That without, without, borders, that without borders and without government, we would just live how, – how will Miami and Cherokee live next to each other? How would we – would no, no, we no, all no, want to no. return to a time when we would grow our own food? That's – that's not realistic. The, the, you know that the reality of more freedom in more capitalism is more abundant. No, I agree. No, I, t- I totally agree. I think the question that, – that reference wasn't the, an argument against libertarianism. Mm-hmm. It's that you may very well have private administers of justice mm-hmm. that you would sign up for as a service because you have an interest in receiving that justice rather than if someone did right. come and aggress against you and steal your chicken – <laughs> that you were, you know, making your eggs with, you didn't have to go and slaughter their chickens in the middle of the night and get retribution right. it's in like a savage a way. Like a homeowners association, or precisely like that. Well, mm-hmm. you, you're arguing the uh, we're. I don't want to have the anarchist versus minarchist no, debate. No, I want to no, talk about immigration, I but do. you're you're very much right, and that's why we are we believe in a constitutional republic here at We Are Libertarians because th- th- you are concentrating force behind. A court system, and you know, you could have the argument that you don't. You could do it with private police, but and that's fine. I'm not against because, that because I. I mean, we had Walter Block. You can go back and listen to Walter Block argue with us against private courts, and I just didn't buy that argument that you you. Uh, if Walter Block can't get me to be persuaded that private courts and anarcho capitalism will work, I just I'm probably not going to get there. And it's not even worth for the most part, having that conversation. Right. Because we can't even decide on a path to citizenship, which we should want. We right. should want right. people that want to come to a place for economic opportunity to be left alone and build a better life. Yeah. What we shouldn't want are people who want to undermine constitutional protections. Right. Mm-hmm. So where, where I have a problem with uh, Jacob Hornberger's worldview, and it's not his worldview. I totally agree with him. It's, we believe the same. It's the path getting there. Well, it's not even the path getting there. It's the articulation of the strategy. It's that when you go and you read what he's talking about, I, I just in, – in prepping for this episode, I just didn't see a lot of, of actual libertarian strategies for, for any kind of solution to move us towards Jacob Hornberger's path. You know, there's a great – Cato. Well, thing. Well, go ahead. Just, like, sure. That's the thing is that it's it's all this thought experiment, and we, we – <laughs> I think that this one problem that we have with libertarians is that we sometimes go so far down this, this thought trail to our ideal society that we forget that we're living in 2017 America where our ideal society is, is if, if not decades, hundreds of years away. It's, it's and, a noble lie. I think – exactly. So like for us to just like go down this, this trail of like – 
well, this makes sense, and therefore the next step makes sense, and then we can have this next step. That's all well and good because logically that's how libertarians think. The problem is is that we, we using logic are in turn having to convince other people who are not using logic and who in many cases are using emotions, and that's just not going to equal to our ideal society because the, the logic and emotional – rhetoric they just won't they won't work together they'll clash nobody voted for ross perot because of his slides that he presented on right on larry King, you know what i mean like they liked him because he was an outsider and kind of you know crazy uncle or grandpa but right. you know that's the point is you you have to meet people where they are and the major we're libertarians 98.5 percent of the american electorate or whatever or no 90 94 percent 95% of the rest of the electorate doesn't believe like we do. Well, the, I, I see there's some Cato studies that that David Bose has done on libertarian voting blocks. Yeah, the libertarian party gets 3%, but that doesn't mean that 97% of the country doesn't believe like we no, do. No, we just need them on election day to believe like we do. Sure. We, we haven't done it. Absolutely. I mean, and, and to that point, here is the Libertarian Party's uh, statement on immigration. I won't I won't read all of it. I'll kind of paraphrase it for you. But uh, libertarians believe that if someone is peaceful, they should be welcome to immigrate to the United States. Libertarians believe that people should be able to travel freely as long as they are peaceful. We welcome immigrants. Now, why are you laughing? Because that's like saying we're against cancer. (laughs) Right. You know what I mean? Like how brave. You're like Aaron Ebert. So brave. It's a statement of principles, okay? I know. But I'm saying like what a a way to just put yourself out there. Who's the one judging who is peaceful? Right, right. Exactly. Who, who is the the moderator saying? Oh, these are peaceful people or not? Yeah, it's like okay, that you're you're contradicting yourself in one sentence, and it just it, it drives me insane. And then Wes Benedict's going to share it, and we're all going to have to talk about how profound it was. The vast majority of immigrants are very peaceful and highly productive, which is true. Indeed, the United States is a country of immigrants of all backgrounds. Uh, newcomers bring great vitality to our society. A truly free market requires the free movement of people, not just products and ideas. Totally agree. Uh, whether they are from India or Mexico, they have advanced degrees or little education. Immigrants have one great in common. They moved here. Uh, let's fast forward. We respect and admire their courage. The fact that you had to fast forward should tell you all you need to know about that. Right. Of course, if someone had a record of violence, credible plans for violence, or acts <laughs> violently, then libertarians support blocking their entry, deporting, and or prosecuting and imprisoning them depending on the offense. To Brian's point – Who's going to do that? You have to have an enforcement mechanism. So the oath keepers. So yeah. So you have to. You <laughs> libertarians do not support classifying undocumented undocumented immigrants as criminals. Our current immigration system is an embarrassment. People who would like to follow legal procedures are unable to because these procedures are so complex and expensive and lengthy, which is true. If Americans want immigrants to enter through legal channels, we need to make those channels fair, reasonable, and accessible. And they aren't fair. Like if you look at the rates of introduction for Mexicans versus British or French, it's ridiculous. It's like you're going to wait 870 years to get in here if you're Mexican. And what people do is they go to Canada, become Canadian citizens, then immigrate to the United States. Right. So There's the path to citizenship. Which we should block immediately, and that should never be negotiated. (laughs) Now this was, and you know what, and that's the scary thing. Where I'm from, up in uh, upstate New York, that that's where a majority of of the illegal aliens who come and work on their the farms up there, mm-hmm. they they go from Mexico to to Canada, and then they cross the border um, through the it's the the Great Lakes, St. Lawrence River Seaway. Mm-hmm. They cross the river, and and then they become you know uh, migrant workers up in the north, working on it could be um, you know, vineyards, it could be on on farms as as hired hands, all for seasonal work. And and the reality is, yes, there's, there's a need for these type of workers. 100%. But the only reason that they're going that route is because, like, like, and it's amazing. This is the one thing that Libertarian Party says is great, that we should make the restrictions easier for mm-hmm. people to come to America legally. The problem is, is that in the, the, the policy talk of Libertarians is that they completely skip that step and go right to open borders, which then completely alienates half the country, if not more. Right. I mean, I mean, that was the entire statement. I mean, there was no outline. And and as a party, a political party, you should have a d- general direction in your in your statement of principles or platform or whatever. And then you let your candidate candidates define those principles. Mm-hmm. But the problem is that it's it's it's, uh, it's not well defined even within the libertarian movement. I mean, as you are in the libertarian party, you are an officer, correct, Sarah? Technically, yes. <laughs> okay. So so what the one percent? So what office do you hold? I am the secretary of the Libertarian Party of Morgan County. Okay. So we're looking for a chairman. Who quit? 
Shocked. The one who's moving. Shocked. Who's yeah. moving? Aaron Ewert's so brave, moving to Franklin County. He's moving, is he? Mayor of Matamora. Possibly. We'll see. Or Matamora. Well, can't he just keep his home half the time in <laughs> Morgan County and half the time in No, I think Franklin? he's life's just really busy for him right now, which I totally understand. So I'm not going to give him too hard of a time. Of his course. camper um, got evicted from the rural king. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't want to talk about you it. Gotta it's do really the, difficult. you got to do the Walmart parking lots. They're the ones where you can park Do you night. know how hard it is to get evi- evicted from Bucktown in your camper? <laughs> I know. I'm telling you. <laughs> when your camper gets moved by the police tow truck he wouldn't get, quit trolling people in real life and showing them memes in the middle of the night <laughs> just kept knocking on their single wides hey, did you see this literally <laughs> lol Ar- aaron aaron was in the desert for like a week and a half and then he resurfaced and i had texted him something and uh basically creighton creighton's fantasy football thing anyway that's not important and <laughs> he said yeah i'll get in touch with him i've missed so many memes can you catch me up <laughs> <laughs> like he That's just hilarious. he just lives on memes. I think uh, Brian like I don't, not to get off oh, that. Hold on, I want to go I want Sarah to give Sarah the chance to answer. I mean, so as a Libertarian Party official, I'm not going to put you on the spot to come okay. up with an answer, but no, you're fine. Chairman Potter. I mean, do woman one of these days you never know. What are your feelings on the Libertarian Party national statement? From what they said, I mean, ideally that's what I would love to go to. I'd love to go to a way where we could potentially just have Oh, thank you. And I'll hand it to you. People traveling freely. However, I do know that just like the way our world is today, that's not something that can happen overnight. It's going to have to be those small steps getting to those places and like going, being able to open it up a little bit at a time. Now, I know one of the things that I noticed in colleges specifically was that if you were from a different country and you were here for school reasons, then you're welcome no matter what. Right. Pretty much. Um, but if you're here for another reason, like to work, and it's very, it's much harder to get one of the work visas than it is to say, well, I'm going to be educated. Right. So I think that's something that we all wanted, would probably want to look at because, I mean, I don't – apologize for everybody personally. Sorry, this is going in an education no, you're fine. part. But, um, it's all connected. There is no it, really separating out immigration from economics from right. a society. It is an, economic, it is an economic activity. I mean the free flow of human beings from one place to another, mm-hmm. the motivation is money. It is property. It isn't – like even here in Indiana, like or if you live – like Brian, why did you move from New York to Philly? Run. Can you hear me? Yeah, so you're back. There we go. Now, okay, yeah. why did you? No, um, go ahead. Really, my so my girlfriend, she was getting her uh, her master's at uh, Temple. Um, so we moved down here together. Um, and you know, with that, I ended up, uh, you know, looking for more opportunity down here, you know, economically, really. Mm-hmm. Which compared to where I'm from, it's it's night and day. So you move for the greatest currency in all the land. <laughs> <laughs> you know it. <laughs> Which now, Chris, this is America. I, Temple <laughs> is a college here. Normally, not somewhere you go. Normal, <laughs> normally, people just to, <laughs> normally people don't let their property lead them around like that, Brian. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> woo! He goes to the gym five days a week. She would enjoy is, that. Is jacked. <laughs> he's he works for a Libertarian Republic. He's used to it. <laughs> he's used Man, to that core sort oh. of humor. Uh, no, uh, yeah, I, but again, she moved there for an economic opportunity. Schooling is an economic opportunity. You go to get a better economic opportunity. Mm -hmm. Like you you would to immigrate to a country for better opportunities. North Koreans, which I found this fascinating in, in like uh, up until the nineties when there was the famine in North Korea, only like 900 people had emigrated to South Korea. I mean, well, that's because there's landmines on the 50th parallel. Well, you separate them that's by like part a mile. Of it. Well, you can go up into China and go around that way, but there's, <laughs> but yeah, like work around. You, you, many people don't cross south into North Korea. They go up to China What's and then around. Thing? Right, right. <laughs> click. Uh oh. Oh god. But uh, no, like the people. But then when there was a famine, that's when China, the northeast part of China and South Korea, it started to swell, and then after that, it's continued to leak because. People, when they can't eat, they leave. I mean, they go mm-hmm. and they find other opportunities. And, you know, people people in North Korea, I mean, I'm not going to say they were happy, but they were they were fairly comfortable until the 90s when, when after the Soviet Union collapsed and they no longer were supporting North Korea. But, like, if you, if you read the end of that book that I really recommend uh, that everybody read, Nothing to Envy by Barbara 
Uh, I don't. I forget Barbara's last name. Er, 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 Emmerich. Ehrlich. Anyways, uh, the final chapters are their stories of people emigrating from China and the, and basically statistics about people leaving North Korea for China for you know even in a country that we think of as poor. Uh, one doctor didn't want to leave, but she left to go find food. Got across. <laughs> got across into China and saw a bowl of white rice just sitting on the ground, white rice that she had not seen in years. Mm -hmm. And the dog walked out of its cage and started eating the rice, and she realized that's when a dog in China eats better than a doctor in North Korea. And then as more people emigrated and started sending back money and opportunities and, and saying, you got to come here, that's when people started to, like, have things peeled off the back of their eyes and started moving. I mean, the people who immigrate are immigrating to improve their station in life, and those people are always more entrepreneurial than even Native Americans, for instance. You know, Native American, not Native Americans in terms Go ahead. of. La of We're lazy, huh? Yep. Yep. The casinos made us lazy after you put us there. No, Native <laughs> Americans as those who were born in that country, not yeah. not Nativists. the not the. La, la, so, yeah, not Ted Cruz's great right. Americans that were born. Right. In. So, I mean, it is it, it is borders are really a meaningless concept. It is people people move for economic opportunity. Mm -hmm. Always it, have. It, always have. And the idea of moving to uh, to better your station is why America is a beacon, and it's why the immigration rate flipped upside down in after the 2008 crisis. More people were moving back to Mexico then we're coming from Mexico to here mm -hmm. because the economics weren't so great. And that was in the middle of the, the great drug crisis on the border down there. Yeah, I mean, the they were side. braving Juarez to go find opportunity, which you always will. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's the thing is this is so hard because it's nuanced. You, right. If I say that I support less immigration from a particular area because the predominance of um, – you know, suicide bombers happen to come from a certain That's level of That's because you're racist, Greg. That's yeah. racist. <laughs> exactly. But, I mean, I own it, and everyone else is like, ooh. ooh. <laughs> no. <laughs> like, ooh, you called me racist. Okay, go away. <laughs> I have a Harry. <laughs> no, but, I mean, it's, it's crazy to me. I, honestly, borders are, borders are an arbitrary concept. But at some point, through the end of feudalism, and then you had mercantilism where – Basically, they, you know, empires decided that they could, by uh, vertically integrating the supply chain, which is all the resources for goods, they could dominate um, the world. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially what happened. And so the larger the borders were, the more area they controlled, the more they could call that part of the greater, you know, the British Empire. And then they could make sure that the French and the Russians or whoever, any competing empire could not have access to the same kind of cheap goods they had, which they could go and then sell for a, a you know a higher profit to those competing empires. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's all economic, and the borders are a lasting vestige of that. You know, it's not like you know I, there is a collectivization of Amer of you know U.S. or world history, but it's it's not like the you know the very early tribes in Mesopotamia didn't have conflict between each other, and they you know it was always from religion or it was from really economics they didn't like it that they were from the fertile you know the more fertile area along the right. river and so that is that has always been the case but if you're going to talk about immigration no libertarian you can't be libertarian and say you don't want immigrants mm -hmm. i'm pro path to citizenship i just want to make sure they believe in libertarian ideas that way i can be sure that if i give them the right to vote they won't vote for more progressive and centralization ideas that like a bigger welfare state, like like right. single payer, like Bernie, and that makes libertarianism impossible because people have a tendency to fear. They prefer, or they're more afraid of what they could lose than what they could gain, mm -hmm. and that's always been the way. You know, humans just have a bias toward that. But aren't you uh, passing some sort of? I mean, a citizenship test is. Oh, I'm I'm pro citizen. Me too. The, yeah, I think that you, I don't care about the dates. I don't care about who did what when. I care about explaining it. To why is this superior than English common law? But Why is X, Y, Z better? What? I don't know. Like some sort of saying you must be libertarian to move here seems like a – If I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you the right to vote, you want to come and work, fine. But if you want to participate in the political process, right. you have to show me that you believe this way. But 50 percent of the country is not libertarian. Well, they have to go back. <laughs> Physically <laughs> right. removed, so but, to speak. But when you want, when you want to talk about a – 
a, a utopian future, passing an immigration bill that would uh, force people to become your political persuasion. No, I would just say that if well, the United States has the Bill of Rights, the, if you come here and immigrate, you, you have or you have to take these tests to become an American citizen. You have to understand the Declaration of Independence. You know, so you have to have a basic understanding of why that was different than any other type of revolution in history. Mm -hmm. It's not like it's. How many slaves did Thomas Jefferson have? Where did he live? What dates was he alive? You right. Know, that isn't a citizenship test. You know, it's the importance of history, not the dates. But what do you think, Brian? I mean, yeah, Greg wins. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. Like, no, but how? We, we, we <laughs> because, for, because. Well, no, because I mean, we, have, we have borders for a reason. Because borders do represent a certain type of ideals. They're lasting um, like relic. that. Exactly. I mean, a, we have, they're why, here. Why a relic Russia of have, a relic of why does Russia have a border, but uh, uh, because it's economic control. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that doesn't. I, I'm control, for getting rid of it. Also, them. based on um, uh, a, a, a mindset of a culture. So not only is it their economic control of their society, but it's also a control of the culture within that society for which uh, they can go ahead and then base their economics on top of that culture. I mean, that's why the United States has a free market society because we have a border that has held those free market values in place. I mean, more or less uh, over the past, obviously 50 years, we've seen more and more uh, progressivism in our, in our free market infrastructure. But, but besides that, I mean, looking at what the entire border represents, it's far more than just economics. It is, it's evolved to the culture which represents the economics. But you're um, making that's you're, why you guys are making better, the, the like, but you guys are making the same argument what? that was made about the Irish moving here, and now that is cult, that is American culture. White people are American culture. I mean, it, it, it at one time it was English people were American culture. Now American culture is bigger than just a, a, an a skin color or there is an one. ethnic okay, but, group. But, but let me ch let me challenge that, Chris. Like so. That, that's well and good, but also you're basing that entire uh, mindset on a, a 19th century philosophy with the much uh, reduced form of the ability to communicate across a, a greater channel. Now in the 21st century, I can sit in my, my apartment here in Philadelphia, and I can message somebody over in Ireland and start having a conversation with, with them to learn more about them, to figure out what makes them tick, versus – Back in the 19th century, in the 20th, being the 20th century, if you were told by someone in your neighborhood that these Irish that were coming into the society were, were you know, the lowest of the low, they're going to steal all your jobs because X, Y, and Z, who are you more likely to believe? The individual that you've been living next to you for the past 20 years or someone who is just walking into your neighborhood for the first time? However, H now Price we have to go on beyond that, that neighborhood. Uh, okay, so what is your argument, though? Like it, it, the argument is that now we have the, we had all this technology that is at the tip of our fingers to go out and reach out to all these different individuals out of different cultures, uh, uh, of different persuasions, to learn what makes them tick, and it helps reduce this boogeyman kind of mentality of the the image that has been painted for them based on the the years of rhetoric that you know our our parents and our grandparents and our great grandparents have painted. Sure. Um, you know, 9-11 was at the beginning of this technological revolution, and when we saw you know, Islamic terrorists take down the Twin Towers, that, that mindset of this Islamic terrorism and that you know, anybody who's brown or has a turban or, or has you know, a funny accent from the Middle East, they automatically were associated with uh, is Islamists. And, and that's just not true. And the ability for us to communicate with individuals across the Internet and to, to become more aware through you know, our ability to talk to people across even the United States and, and to interact with people of these different cultures, it helps reduce this boogeyman culture and this boogeyman mindset. But the, but the problem so is the – understand. But the actual outcome is exactly what you're – I mean I'm not arguing for a 19th century racist policy. That's exactly what Donald Trump embodies. I'm arguing for economics to be the judge, not for for a government to be the judge. Because if you look at the people that are admitted to this country, it is based on skin color, it is based on ethnicity, it is based on race, and and no and matter making the rules right now, the, the government. I mean, it's your favorite. It's well, but who's your it's favorite generation that's control of the government? It, it's the baby boomers. The baby boomers grew up in in this this uh, 1940s to 1960s and 70s. 
uh, era in the United States where you know, it was identity politics. I mean, it was the Japanese in internment camps. It was the, the communists and the Russians over in, in, in uh, the Soviet Union. And, and they were the ones that were put into power over the past 30, 40 years and now are at the, the forefront of government. I mean, Trump is the epitome of the baby boomer generation in power with his last hurrah. Exactly. And do you think uh, – Yeah, but do you honestly think that Trump and your grandparents are going to be able to effectively utilize the internet – to reach beyond their echo chambers to, to you know pat their own confirmation biases versus the the millennial generations and generation x who are able to go out and use technology the way it's supposed to be used to try to learn and try to engage with other individuals and actually try to make things better going forward instead of just embracing this rhetoric that has been passed down generation to generation. The, the problem with your argument is that the baby boomers were promising in the late 60s to not be as racist as their parents. And, and they're so not. I'm arguing that economics, when you let economics decide who and does not, who is and does not come into a country, uh, who is coming in and who is not coming in, the only color that economics sees is green. And, and you, have to, you have to be careful there because I'm for all exchange of goods. All commerce. Don't care. Do whatever you want. Trade with whoever you want. I'm not going to ban you from selling gas to North Korea. I don't care. I care if I'm going to give you the right to vote, to run for elected office, and to change the laws. Two totally different things. Sure. So I don't have a problem. Anyone wants to come here and conduct trade or get a job, great. Anyone, Go for it. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone that wants to run for office and wants to propose an amendment to get rid of, uh, hell, the right to free speech, Bye bye. The nature of government is that it divides people along superficial lines, like. But so does religion, and class, so does tribe, and class, so does anything. But it, it is it is far more defined in a society where government is far more in control. Because you look at the culture war, for instance. You you look at something like gay marriage. Does anybody in their personal life, does any if if let's say uh, you and Brian wanted to get married. I would say, I don't right. care. You guys are my friends. I'm very happy. Would you say, do you want gay people to get married? My entire concept of you two being my friend goes out the window and I go, I'm using the government to protect my values because those godless We're commie, a Christian nation. Those godless, God's providence. Those godless commie avatars are going to steal <laughs> all, my, all my Christian rights away. I mean – it, it government forces people to defend values in a way that free markets and free societies do not. It doesn't force them to. It gives them the ability to. Government is simply a representation of what the will is. That's the thing you have to remember because libertarians act like government's an abstraction. It's purely an institution comprised by the very men that we're talking about are so great. Mm -hmm. We're talking – you know, government is supposed to be – the best part of all of us that's better than any individual person. Like if someone kills, for instance, Brian, and we're in love and got married, you know, living the perfect Philadelphia upper middle class yuppie homosexual lifestyle <laughs> in our hush puppy shoes and our little terrier. I've seen Philadelphia. <laughs> I've seen Philadelphia. I feel bad for you boys. <laughs> exactly. We're going to go up and do selfies with Rocky Balboa. That's me too. I've, <laughs> I'm talking about the movie. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're the one in the baseball hat. Well, a little Brett Bittner story. No, um. No, but I'm saying like that, that is something where I don't know. I, I, we aren't perfect. And so it, if uh, – what's the John Adams say? If men weren't angels, they wouldn't need government. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, government is just yeah. the ability for these same non-angels to go and, if unchecked, for you know a long period of time, create the type of things that we feared in the first place. So you're saying I, I, I made, love like, – yeah, I love Brian I and say, Greg, it, but by God, you know, I'm going to use the government to protect from those two ever getting involved in it. You know, it's kind of a disconnect. It's 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 a paradox, really, because libertarians say we love everybody, free trade, everybody's great, mm -hmm. people are angels, there are no bad people. It doesn't take one bad skittle, and then everything's projected onto this government that is very simply just a representation of what people believe. You and know? like, if I may, like, that, I think maybe that's why I identify more recently as a classical liberal, um, more so than a libertarian, like a pure libertarian, because. I go back to the, the founding of this nation and the Constitution. Like, you know, agree with it or not, the Constitution is the basis for which this nation is, is built upon. Yeah. And with mm -hmm. that, we have not only the, the, the core Constitution, but also the Bill of Rights. And the entire premise of our laws are supposed to be built not only upon the Constitution, but also with that, the amendments being the Bill of Rights. So, you know, for instance, with the 14th Amendment, as it's been interpreted by the Supreme Court, that is supposed to now – um, you know, recognize same-sex individuals entering into a legally binding contract. That's right. just 
the way that our system has worked. But I can't go and run for office right now and say that I'm going to make a law ban all Muslims because I believe America should be a Christian nation. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, have my legislation pass two days after 9-11 because we're all you know using our, our emotions to cast our votes. But, you know, then go forward and have you know, a, a slight majority pass. And then, you know, you have all these Muslim Americans who are now, you know, being, you know, taken away from the, the America that they've known and love if they've been lifelong citizens and the likes. That's not how our system works, though. And I think that's one thing libertarians need to remember is that you know, that's not the means in which our society has been built upon. We have these checks and balances for a reason. And yes, some of the reasons are cultural and some of the reasons are economical. I don't think we have to pick one or the other, though. I think we have to realize that when the founders, you know, the founders and the framers we're making this nation that they had this in mind and they made it difficult for us to just go ahead on a whim and make these ra or these radical changes just because we have some you know ter terrific event that happens so yes it's economical yes there there are things that we make decisions on entirely based on economics and yes there are things that are cultural that we make decisions on based on what's happening with our our contemporary lives but i don't think it has to be one or the other it's not a zero sum game and that's not the way america was built you're you're relatively new to the libertarian movement and party as a whole, yes. but you've probably had libertarian beliefs most of your life. Yeah. You wouldn't just, let's say, you know, you, you, I people have doors on their homes for a reason. You know what I mean? Like, there's a little, you're always a little nervous, right? Not necessarily nervous, but I know, like, for me, being able to have the right to defend my property and my person, that is a big deal. So having a door that locks at night, that's something I appreciate. I have a door on my house to protect me from Americans, not, <laughs> exactly. not from Mexicans. The but you would rather – like let's say someone did steal something. Wouldn't you rather go and call the Southport police rather than go and take – you know, call? well, you can't call mine anymore. So <laughs> <laughs> you know, the privately administered police system failed but, you. But I, I, I guess I don't understand what you're arguing because – My argument is that it, everyone fears what they don't know. And so when that's the case, it's a terrible thing to go and blame it on the boogeyman government, which is no different than – because you're, you're absolving the, the guilt but the of opposite the of is. But the opposite is exactly what you're doing, which is we'll blame it on the boogeyman Mexican who might come and steal your shit if you don't put a border around the place. No, I'm saying that, that regardless, the government's the wrong thing to put it on. It's on, your, it's on your lack of familiarity and you maybe having biases. And then the government just lets you, imp, you know, put those biases on a grand scale. I'm biased against the government because I. But what is a government? A, a, <laughs> a government is a a grouping of people who have perverse no, incentives. It's buildings. People are government with perverse it. with perverse incentives. Right. When you when you craft laws and you craft bad laws and too many laws, you create perverse incentives. Mm -hmm. And that is my argument: is that the incentives the the borders allow more poor incentives. I'm not I'm not an open borders person necessarily because I agree with exactly what you're saying. The idea that libertarian party people or libertarian anarchists or you know uh, people larpers larpers essentially sit there and say we're going to have open borders tomorrow that's a fool's a foolish statement. Right, it's too radical a change. You'll create exactly. the opposite. Exactly. Right. There there it'll all of a sudden be everyone has to be in their home at 11 p.m. It, in cur mandatory curfews. Yeah, and everything I did in researching this topic there was only one article from Reason called uh where where did I put it? Uh a libertarian solution to immigration reform. Fantastic article. Great article. It was the only thing from Ed Kr Ed K R A Y E W S K I. He lives here in Philadelphia. Okay, and it's a libertarian solution to immigration reform, and it was written on March fourth, twenty fourteen. And uh, you know, just to, to let me read a couple bits of this because this was literally the only libertarian solution to immigration I could find. And that is the that is the disturbing, Problem. annoying thing is that you can't. I love Jacob Hornberger, and I've learned a lot from him over the years. But you just can't go out there and say, "I'm a larper." I'm like, here's what I want. People want that in between step. You have to have it because if you don't, right. they're going to want shut down borders. Nobody gets in. You right. know, it, we let them in. We tried it once. It was too scary. Right. We kicked them out. Now we want order, and we don't want any more raping. 
So, so, uh, and that's, you know, I'm, I'm overplaying it, but that's the reality of what would happen. I just right. need a final solution to this problem, Greg. But the immigration crisis. Well, that, that asshole hadn't put the Japs in camp. <laughs> the, the, the so called immigration crisis is, again, a crisis of the government's making, and that's, that's part of the issue. But Ed Cryo, how, how do you pronounce it? Kurwitzki. Kurwitzki. Uh, from a rights and limited government perspective, normalizing the situation of illegal immigrants ought to take priority, take top priority. Le- lack of legal status prevents illegal immigrants from participating in economic and civic life. As I've argued before, it is not access to welfare that drives illegal immigrants' desire for legal status, but rather access to property and other rights that are in our modern society, unfortunately tied to government documentation and recognition. Focusing on a pathway to citizenship recognizes the need for illegal immigrants to have government recognition in order to buy and sell property, enter into contracts, use the court system for dispute resolution, and so on. It provides a way to depoliticize the issue and broaden its appeal. For a libertarian solution, the path to legalization isn't about delivering new voters for Democrats or increasing the welfare rules, but about creating a legal environment where millions of people already living in the U.S. can become full and active participants in the economy. It would involve providing federally recognized legal status for illegal immigrants that would fall short of citizenship or permanent residency but allow them to participate in economic and social life. A work license. To open up bank accounts, Mm -hmm. drive and acquire occupational licenses, board planes, and do many other things that require an ID in America today. Concurrently, a libertarian solution would repeal laws that penalize employers for hiring the wrong person, according to the government. Employers have as much of a right to associate freely as immigrants have to travel freely. Government edicts should not come in the way of someone who wants to work and someone who wants to pay for work. And the the other issue with with illegal immigration is that people are kept in the shadows. Like I had an ex-girlfriend of mine who said, you know, I'm not for – for I'm for toughening illegal immigrants because I I have a friend who is an immigrant and she just told me about how often she was raped by all the other immigrants and I said Sweden I said you know why that is it's not because the immigrants are more likely to rape it's that she's less likely to go to the police and report rape because right. she's afraid of being sent back and that's where government creates perverse incentives that would not exist if it were not for bad policy. If they were allowed to economically provide. Right. Now, voting is different. I mean, voting is very different, or it should be, in my so, opinion, because if you right. offer political can access... We, can we find a compromise, though? I mean, can we agree that the reason that there's bad policy is because the bad policy is is not taking into consideration the, the limits that have been placed upon the government itself within the Constitution? Right. I mean, they, 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 they've expanded so far beyond the realm, uh, you know, through what what the the Constitution had stated in the first place, I mean, with Obama going ahead and and you know, doing the entire DACA Act in the first place, I mean that's all well and good. I think that you know DACA we talked about this with uh, Harry a couple of weeks ago, like the DACA kids, good for them. But it was the wrong way for Obama to do it because again, it's just it's perverting the the system and it's violating the system. So I think if we just if we take a time out and we take a step back towards the way that the system had originally been set up that we wouldn't have all this bad policy because the bad policy wouldn't be able to get passed because it's not constitutional. All right. Uh, sorry about that. My mic was shut off because I was blowing my nose. I want to talk about the uh, the fiscal impact of immigration, and this was from a great article by Daniel T. Griswold, one of my favorite names, Griswold. Immigration and the Welfare State. <laughs> immigration and the Welfare State, Cato Journal, Volume 32, Number 1, Winter of 2012. Uh, Now, Daniel Griswold is the director of the Herbert Stifel Center for Trade Policy and Studies at the Cato Institute. And uh, the (laughs) – I'm just looking at the chat, and Aaron's making me laugh. Aaron is allegedly on the back porch saying that Brian seems so distant. Uh, So measuring measuring the fiscal impact of immigration. So a major challenge to measuring fiscal cost of immigration is that it's a multi-generational phenomenon. So when they move here, they have children. People like the DACA children move here. Uh, The most authoritative and study of fiscal impact of immigration was passed, was published by the National Research Council in 1997. Now these, this is a 20 year uh, study, but this was the best he could find in 2012. And it's titled The New Americans, Economic, Demographic, and Fiscal Effects of Immigration. 
And what it found is that immigrants and their descendants represent a net fiscal gain for the U.S. Uh, it represents a positive $80,000 fiscal gain to the government in terms of present value. It, uh, an immigrant with more than a high school education plus descendants represents a 198000 fiscal gain, one high school diploma, a $51,000 uh, gain, dollar gain, and one without a $13,000 loss. So while a typical immigrant is we less well-educated, the children of immigrants are upwardly mobile. They never stay in that lower class. They generally move their way up. And the, they, the upfront fiscal cost is not because they consume more government services. And we'll talk about the myth that they are welfare queens in no, a moment. But yeah. The, because it's just it, – it's, well, we can't have the Milton Friedman line – he, he just in 1999 released a scourge on this entire debate in the conservative and libertarian movement by declaring you cannot simultaneously have free immigration and a welfare state. It's not, it's not the reality of the situation, and I'll explain why in a moment. Uh, they, it's, the benefit is not because of the benefits they receive but because of the taxes they pay. They, and immigrants have less education – and they pay lower taxes because it's lower level, and um, they, they basically they participate in a black market. Right. The minimum amount of uh, government taxation and revenue sources from the government when you have undocumented status is going to be minimized, but the economic impact is still huge because people are going to naturally gravitate right. towards cheaper labor. They they have a positive impact because they usually arrive at young working ages. And their dependents are expected to have higher skills and incomes. Uh, and if you look at Texas, Texas was a uh, – they did a study in Texas on um, their impact, and it was just a – it was a shocking amount of extra income oh, it's an, it's, in Texas. I mean it's created a huge boom. I mean, right. but I mean, if you think about it, it's, it's mouths to feed. It's clothes to buy. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, one you know, all economic impact. Or all economic yeah. demand, and you're not just going to all of a sudden deport everybody and then say, "Oh my God, we entered a depression." Who knew? Who so, ever guessed? So when you look at yeah. and go ahead, Brian. I said, well, and and literally as we were doing this this conversation, uh, Fox News poll, a Twitter account, uh, literally it's called at Fox News poll, uh, new record eighty three eighty three percent favor pathway to citizenship for illegal immigrants working in the United States. Uh, compare that to July of twenty fifteen. Uh, in terms of legalizing, it was 64% for, in terms of deporting, 30% for deporting them. That's amazing. Um, so it's a huge see, progress. Uh, yeah, almost a 20% jump in, in individuals in America saying, yes, legalize them, and, and a 15, 16% drop in, in people pushing for them to be Give them deported. access and for I those who want it. That should be your immigration exactly. goal is mm -hmm. we yes. want people who want to be here. So, we don't want people yes. – you have to worry about people who are fleeing somewhere in a crisis. You know, it's, it's two totally different things. So let's go back to that multi-year study with the National Research Council, and let's explain that $80,000 fiscal gain for the United States. Uh, it's a positive 105000 fiscal impact for the federal government and a negative $25,000 impact for state and local governments. And that is because they don't use welfare benefits, but they do use the education system. And uh, if you go back and you look at Texas, like I mentioned, uh, one of the comprehensive state-based studies was issued in 06 by the Texas Comptroller, Strayhorn 2006, titled Undocumented Immigrants in Texas, a Financial Analysis for the Impact to the State and Budget Economy. Uh, it specifically unauthorized immigrants in fiscal year 2005 paid a total of $2 billion in taxes at the state and local level while consuming $2.6 billion in services. Um, thus, the fiscal cost for the state and local taxpayers – was from illegal immigration that year was five hundred and four million. The fiscal cost, however, was more than offset by the boost to the size of the Texas economy. Uh, another finding from the study, and they use something called the regional economic model. And uh, the model found that the resulting drop in the state's labor force would cause wages remaining workers to rise slightly by less than one percent, but the higher wages caused by tightening labor markets would make producers in the state less competitive, resulting in a modest decline in the value of the state's exports, and it would shrink by $17 billion. 
So yes, the state loses five hundred and four million, but the value of the labor is seventeen billion dollars to Texas, which helps them keep their their taxes lower. And if you really look at where most of the illegal immigrants settle, it is in states that have lower taxes. It is not high welfare states. No, and I mean that's it's normal too because there are still better cultural ties and family networks that are going to be closer. You know, and for the most part, the South is still a little bit more of an agrarian economy than – I mean, it's by no means primarily an agricultural-based economy, but it still has more uh, types of jobs where you are purely monetizing your ability to work hard. And you could also look at the investment. The loss that you take on that education is a better uh, – you, you are taking somebody whose parents were paid for by Mexico's dime, for instance – they come here, and then you educate their child, and then you have an upwardly mobile at a faster rate in, in, in terms of society moving into society. And the becoming cost of a, educating them is right. way less than the cost or the um, amount of revenue you gain from feeding that kid for 18 years and clothing that kid and that kid participating in going to movies and yada, you know, mm-hmm. going on spring break. Right. You know, the, it is a huge – it's a subsidy basically. And – the the actual actually immigration has helped stave off the dropping birth rate here in the United States. That's the kicker. And uh, in 1970, almost a quarter of the U.S. population, 22 percent, were K-12 students enrolled in public schools. By 1980, that fall that share had fallen 18 percent, and by 90, 16 percent. And uh, Im- the share of the population in public schools rose slightly to 17 percent. So they do. Uh, they're forced to go to school. If you don't right. go to school in this country, they please come arrest you and yep. take you away from your parents. So I want to. So, I mean, it's kind of like having it both days. ways, right? Ten days. That's all they get. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, it's before their parents get in trouble. It's like, oh, we have to pay for their school. Damn and, it! Why do we make it mandatory? An illegal immigrant also costs us less in healthcare costs because they are often more likely. <laughs> they are often more likely uh, younger. They consume less health care. They're not going to go unless they absolutely have to to provide ID. They are younger and healthier than the native-born population, so check out your Walmart. (laughs) And uh, the immigrants in my Walmart are much, much skinnier than the white people. (laughs) The white people. Uh, The study, the Rand Corporation in 06, I thought this was really interesting. The Rand Corporation uh, accounted, the study estimated foreign-born residents, including undocumented immigrants, accounted for 8.5% of health care spending nationwide while accounting for 13% of the total population. Undocumented immigrants, so the last was foreign-born, undocumented immigrants imposed 1.5% of medical costs while accounting for 3.2% of the population. Because you're uh, going to be put in a system. like that, You're yep. going to be inserted into a database if you go into an emergency room. So you're natu- there's a natural disincentive that exists. You know, It's prohibitive to go in there and get on – Get on the grid, basically. Yeah, and so here's a key cultural piece of information that I think is interesting. Foreign-born residents use less funding from public insurance and pay more out of pocket for health care than native-born residents do, a, a pattern that is even more pronounced in undocumented immigrants. I can solve immigration in a heartbeat. Get rid of Social Security cost of living adjustments and it being indexed for inflation for baby boomers unless, you know, we just don't have the money. We're going to have to find you know, new taxpayers. Yeah. All of a sudden, baby boomers are going to be like, Bring them in. Que pasa? <laughs> yeah. You know? <laughs> exactly right. They're going to be having a siesta on the border. Well, because the – so there's a fund for uncollected Social Security. And the, <laughs> the when this study was released in 2012, that fund was $200 billion yeah. because it's undocumented immigrate, immigrants paying into the Social Security system, and they'll never collect. Yep. Exactly, and yeah, they and they know it, and they choose to do it anyway, which means they're here for the opportunity, which you know goes back to the heart of all of it is that's who you want. So a uh, typical foreign-born adult resident is also more likely to participate in the workforce than an American, uh, or, well, because as a they don't born. have access to the welfare benefits. Well, a, a foreign-born resident, not an illegal immigrant, but a foreign-born resident. The labor force participate so it could be anybody born in a different country, but they have citizenship even. A labor force participant. Uh, you still don't get it for five years, though, even as a citizen. It, yeah, and I will explain that because I think it's yeah. important to understand. The, the uh, male, the labor force participation of foreign-born men in tw- 2010 was 80%, a full 10% higher than the white man, the native-born people. Um, it, it also... 
shows that journalist Jason Riley and Let Them In noted that many of the states that have seen the largest increases in their immigrant population in the past are also states with relatively low social spending. Uh, He says that the 10 states with the largest percentage increase in foreign-born population between 2000 and 2009 uh, are states with the slowest growing foreign-born population, and it's also where they pay the less taxes. So like Kentucky, Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina, like if they were welfare queens, they'd go to Michigan, Rhode Island, and Vermont, which are not growing. So, uh, man, I lost the, the, the best part, the welfare part, because this is, this is the capper that I saw in this study. Uh, the argument that we can't have open borders because we have a welfare state, they legally cannot – Due to the 90, 1996 passage of the personal re- Title IV of the Personal Responsibility and Work <laughs> Opportunity Reconciliation Act of 96. Bill Clinton's major welfare reform. Yep. Has sufficiently been the basic principle of the U.S. immigration law. And in particular, aliens within the nation's borders should not depend on public resources to meet their needs. And the availability of public benefits should not constitute an incentive for immigration. And so they, the law bars le- newly legalized permanent residents from eligibility for a range of federal income support programs for at least the first five years of residency. And uh, if you are an illegal immigrant, you can't, you can't access any of these anyways. The, literally the only piece of social welfare that any illegal immigrant can access at the state, federal, or local level – I can't say local, but state and federal level – is that they can enroll their children in public K-12 schools and they can be treated for emergency medical needs. And if you look at the emergency room, don't listen to your nurse friends. The rate of emergency spending is a drop in the bucket compared to what Medicare. Americans. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Medicare is where most of the fraud goes. $32 billion a year just in the fraud. So your your nurse friends are just bitching about illegals because they're Trump voters. Because <laughs> well, they it's, don't have insurance. So – it just it's it's a complete falsehood that I mean when you really look at the the overarching picture of what illegal immigrants add to our society, it is overwhelmingly economically beneficial. Mm-hmm. And when we when when you start talking about the cultural aspects of it, I live in I live in a very ethnically diverse area. And I don't mind it. There's, there is, I'm not in a crime-ridden area of the city. The people that I'm around, the Chin, out of Burma, there are Christians who are persecuted by the Buddhists, move to my area. <laughs> I know, the Buddhists are violent in Burma. <laughs> Killing, yeah, no, it's, it's the Chin. Confucius ruins everything. Right. No, it's real life. I mean, they're great people. They're no friendly shit. people. Okay. Yeah, I hang out with them at the library, me and Let's me and be the honest, shin. they're like Lutherans. They're not that great. <laughs> they're great. If you have to have they're them as neighbors, great. they're great. But, I mean, they're not, it's not like they're Methodists. I've got to say, though, I used to work at a pool during the Ooh. summer, and they would have the Chin Church would come, and there would be like <laughs> 300 of them. I kid you not. 300 of them. They were the nicest people. Oh, they're amazing. Very polite, and they – Followed every rule they could. Now, mind you, because there were so many, there was always at least like one or two kids that just like somebody didn't have an eye on them. They right. fell in the pool, whatever. It was you very know. sad. We had a ceremony. It was fine. That, yeah. no, nobody ever died. <laughs> we were fine. But it was one of those things where whenever they came, it was like, oh, we're going to have some nice people here. And you didn't have to worry about, you know, a bunch of the pool rat teenagers that, mind you, they are all white. Um, they were the ones that were causing problems because they were like, oh, this is my, this is my pool. It, know, it right? is, but white people are the worst. <laughs> they You're are a white the, male, Chris. White people are ruining this country. Not, AIDS Skrillex. My co-host turned into AIDS Skrillex. Not, <laughs> not clean white people like me. I'm good, but uh, I, I don't know. So, like, if, if, if you look at the Chris Spangle plan for immigration – I I am going to end the the shaming of illegal immigrants. I'm going to welcome them into this country, and I agree. Citizenship should be very hard to get. Well, not, I mean, not but, necessarily hard to get. You just have to prove you want it with a few steps since we're going to give mm-hmm. you the control over yourself. Correct. There should be background I'll, checks. I'll that shit. Yeah, there should be background checks. We should make sure that people who are coming here are not violent. We should make sure that people are not criminals that are coming here. But we should – Equalize the playing field in terms of the country that wants to come in here and go to school here, work here. 
they are adding a tremendous amount of benefit to this country, and the attitude that they are coming here to ruin our culture is absolutely ridiculous. It's just not true. And But it's the revenge of the Walmart voter. They're the Walmart. Right. Yeah, it's their, they believe <laughs> it's easier to blame their lot in life on illegal immigration because they believe the undocumented immigrants are undermining their earning power, and it's way easier for companies to go ahead and pay $6 and, go, and factor in the cost of a major fine and getting caught than go ahead and hire someone at the federal minimum wage, which, I mean, it always goes back to economics. And so they see their, you know, they, they're sort of the, a decay from what their parents were and their grandparents were. Like, it's, it's actual downward social, uh, you know, economic status and trending. And so they are upset that they don't have union per- yeah. perks and benefits. I'm upset. Right. And so they're looking for someone to blame. And the real culprit is federal minimum wage standards. But they would never go work for five forty five an hour right. or you know paid in cash they would not. they would absolutely not do that and that but they don't care about that argument. they care about it's so much easier to just blame it on them because I don't like them. they make me look bad because you know they're hard working and want the opportunity that I scoff at because I'm a white male, you know <laughs> I won't go do that. You know, McDonald's, right. ugh, they're lucky to have me instead of seeing it as an opportunity. We had a friend today, and she's so right. She's like, I, I am middle class now. I'm not going to do that. I don't, I don't remember what it was that she wasn't going to do, but it was just very, like, I am. That's below me. I am too middle class to go do that low shit. Like, well, that's go what people to don't go into vocational school. Like, that's right. the reason they don't go learn a skill they can immediately monetize because, I don't know, my parents were white collar. I can't go become a welder. You know, there's these stigmas that so have true. factored in all of this. Yes. And there's way too much pressure to do that, too, because, like, what your skills are don't always line up with something that you can do in college. And, like, I think you're a pretty big... Uh, college isn't about skill acquisition, though. It's about exposing you exactly. to ideas. So that's what College I'm was a waste need... of time. Exactly. I dropped out. I dropped out, and it was a waste of time. And I will share some information with you at the end of the show that will prove I'm right. But basically what I'm saying is, like, people who have those skills, you know, an interest in something where it's a skilled trade where you're going to be performing an apprenticeship or something like that along those lines where you're actually learning Hourly what payment. the heck you're going to be doing while you're working, um, that's probably the smarter option at this point. Oh, there's a huge structural de- – I mean, structural unemployment versus, like, cyclical where there's a drop because of a depression versus mm-hmm. a mismatch in skills. We would – I mean, we already are, what, 4.7%? 4, 4. We'd be at, like, 2 Right. You know, there is a big mismatch in the skill force because of this white identity that I don't I won't work an hourly wage, work for an hourly wage because my parents were insurance reps or because, right. you know, something along those lines. I won't take a step back because it feels like, you know, going down the ladder. Right. And I don't want them to suffer from that embarrassment. Mm-hmm. Uh, Brian, what do you True. think? Do you subscribe I mean, that's, to the that's spot do, on. do you subscribe to the Chris Spangle plan that we we are going to lighten up on immigration? It's not a crisis. It's good for the economy. We're going to give everybody work visas. Uh, we're going to screen for the criminals. But we're going to stop all this nonsense where we really need to. Uh, where like listen, in my mind, the, a lot of the conservatives just. They use the N word as they're sitting there complaining about the Mexicans. Even no, you know, they're just mm-hmm. yes, no, it's, I mean, it's all racist. The, 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 the whole immigration debate. You act like the Republican Party is all Roy Moore's. They are, <laughs> bro. <laughs> what, what are you not paying attention? It's all Sarah Palin, Mike Mike Huckabee's the civilized one, they, and then the rest are they, Roy Moore, Donald Trump, Steve Bannon, and you know, prove me wrong, Paul Ryan. Prove me wrong, but like, Lindsey Graham. I, I, I like I said. I think that this this Republican Party that we're watching right now, with, with Donald Trump being the the head of the party, this is the baby boomers' last hurrah. Mm-hmm. And and I mean, by and large, the baby boomer boomer generation was a a generation that grew up through very very strenuous racial times. Not for them. Through <laughs> yeah, they, <laughs> not for them. Vietnam sucked for um, them, but other than that, well, it, yeah, absolutely. But like, think about with with. The, the civil rights movement happening in the 60s, 50s and 60s um, with 9-11 happening and, and all these minorities that were branded as you know the, the bad guy. And, and those movements don't disappear overnight. Um, if you look and see that the upcoming generation, those mindsets, I think if you were to compare them to their, the generations ahead of them, our generations, they're, they're much more socially accepting 
They're much more understanding and they're much more willing to go out and talk to other individuals that are different from them instead of just shutting, shutting out entirely at the onset. So I think, you know, Chris, you're hundred percent right. Going forward, we're going to see a much greater approach uh, to allowing uh, immigrants to come to America. I think we're going to see a, uh, a much more weakened immigration policy, not from the stance of not allowing individuals in, but making it easier for them to get in while still being able to vet them properly. Um, and I, I just, I genuinely believe that with technology that we have nowadays, that's only going to make the the entire immigration uh, debate it, it'll become much less and less and less as time goes on because we have the ability to reach out and communicate and learn from all these different people instead of just giving them a stigma and letting that stigma last for generations. Now, Greg, you hate minorities, and you love the wall. Uh... <laughs> I just want to throw one person in the Rio Grande. Is that too much to ask? <laughs> Preferably Bittner, and that's an American. <laughs> Honestly, after tonight, I'm with you, because he's like, oh, I can be on in two weeks. I'm like, bro, that's what you said two weeks ago. That offer doesn't exist. You, we live in the now, and you, yours is gone. You didn't remind me. I have given you a calendar for that reason. Here in uh, We Are Libertarians. He wants, oh, the expectation's on you to right. have reminder. He wants a subsidy. It's, he wants it's, a wall it's subsidy. It's my, it's my responsibility, not his personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. Bittner is a communist. Left libertarians <laughs> need to be physically removed. That's They're exactly no what I'm saying. different than godless commies. <laughs> so what, what is the Greg Lynn's plan for immigration? Anyone can work. Anyone that wants to be a citizen, it's a five-year path to citizen. You have to have a proven track record of employment. And then you go through the steps, similar to the one that actually really already exists, and you don't put a limit on it. I'm for opening up the path to citizenship for anyone that wants to apply. But I'm also, while you're here trying to walk through those steps, you get five years to work and there's no restriction on your job or your career or what you want to pursue. So long as you do those two things and so long as you understand the concepts of what America's premised upon about what government can't do to you, I'm fine with it. My big concern it was a George Mason study, and it showed that if specifically Hispanic Americans are ideal for who you want, except for one thing, 56% of uh, people that have immigrated here, the DACA kids basically, want more government inter inter intervention in the economy. And that's a statistic I can't look away from because I don't want someone coming here who's then going to vote to change the laws, run for office, manipulate a motion, just no different than what Steve Bannon and Donald Trump did. Right. I mean – Politics is much faster. It happens much quicker. Trends arrive faster because the news cycle is so rabid. And so I don't I, – you just can't afford to let a – it would be like letting a bunch of Berkeley people come from China and you know fleeing communism, and they're going to create the perfect Marxist state here. And then you're shocked to realize that all of a sudden you don't have free speech and you're a dissident. Right. It doesn't – the world doesn't work that way. You ha, what you have is worth holding on to. And so if you don't – if you just open up to anyone and give them the right to vote and authority over you, you're stupid. And you sound like the idiot left libertarians who I can't stand and wish would just – you know, they're Bernie bros, but that's not unique enough. So how do you, uh, how do you perform – how do you administer and enforce your no leftists policy? There was a great general in Chile. <laughs> I'm a Pinochetian minarchist is what I really believe. I no, no you just, what you do is you limit access to the political system. So you come, you have five years. Then the tests don't need to be on dates and about what Thomas – you know, if Aaron Burr shot Alexander Hamilton, you know, it doesn't need to be on the names. It needs to be give me – compare and contrast. This would be my citizenship test. What is the difference between English common law? And a constitutional republic like that was found, a federal democratic republic that was founded in the United States. And that would be it. If you can explain it and understand that how it was a quantum, you know, a radical shift in what government can do, can't do to you and explicitly defined, plus giving the Second Amendment, which it's all premised upon anyway, then I don't really want you because you are a progressive. Doesn't, you don't have anything that's like a, a con principle. You just make everything based on feels and moral relativism. Mm -hmm. All right. I like your plan. I will adopt it into the Spangle plan. We will call it the Spangle Lens plan. And uh, we've solved immigration tonight. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it really isn't that hard. And it's necessary because economic growth is entirely premised upon your um, immigration numbers. Right. The birth rate you, you talked about earlier. It's totally natural for white people, for any, any of the wealthy in a society – 
you kind of move up Maslow's hierarchy. You get to self-actualization. Kids are kind of a burden. I really want to be a poet. It'd be really <laughs> hard to afford children walk <laughs> with my with my Taylor Swift Tumblr and my you know my my uh, third co-host compensation. Honestly, uh, I don't want kids because I want to be a successful libertarian podcaster. So, but I mean that's natural. Everyone moves up that hierarchy where your parents were less selfish, somebody and less concerned with self actualization because they right. didn't have the option. And that is what you're going to see, though, is you end up getting zero population growth and even negative population growth for Caucasians. So that means you can either have less of a welfare state, which no one will accept, right? or you'll open up to immigrants, take the tax, the tax revenue for five years, not give them any benefits, and then allow them to participate, take the economic boost. And then if they're someone that believes like you do, that you think will continue on the principles that the country is based upon, I'm going to be dead anyway, and I'll take the Medicare subsidy. Here you go. You have citizenship. Continue it on. I also am probably not going to have kids because I haven't been on a date in like a year. Now, that's been self-imposed, but I'm ready to date. So if you're an attractive young lady out there, or even just a lady, slide in those DMs at this point. Uh, but you have to be one of the two genders. Right. <laughs> no Zs. No Zs. No, uh, now, uh, we'll ask Sarah next, but uh, Brian, is there any amendments that you would like to make to the Spangle Lens plan? I mean, I wouldn't say that I don't agree with Greg saying that, uh, you know, the, the ideological test for, you know, down the road. I, I just look at when we have all these Cubans prior to the, the ban on Cuban immigrants coming to the United States. The refugees. Like, from the right. Castro if you look at the yeah. Cubans that are here in America now, a majority of them are, are Republican. Um, um, the and there's a reason for that. Yeah. And, and I think we need to. We need to be open. To, I, mean, I, I agree what you're saying because I understand you're saying that um, you know the individuals who would come into America, if they're Antifa, if they're communist socialists, well, if they're they just more used to communal issues. solutions because they're more community oriented, it's going to be yeah. very much more. We need to, you know, it takes a village mindset rather than rugged individualism that is libertarianism. So my 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 belief is, and it, it might come across naive almost, but if we Take your idea and just – I don't know if, if I want to ban them from going – like they have to go back or whatever or not even – No, they just not become citizens. They can work system. as long as they want. Is that what you're saying? No, they can stay here as okay. long as they want and work. They just can't vote. They can't participate okay. in the political I mean, process. I, I can get on board with that more. I just uh, – Okay, I guess that, that changes my mind a little bit because I was, I was under the impression they'd, like, they'd have to go back. No, but, no, no. They can um, always be here and work and pursue a better life. They just can't shape the laws of the country. But if they want to go back, okay. Greg, Greg is happy to help <laughs> them go back. We have subsidized <laughs> helicopter rides for anyone named Bittner, anyone I, that's keto, or a left libertarian. <laughs> and I'll, I'll, I guess I'll finish with this because it almost feels like this is a final thoughts for immigration. Um, Homeland Secretary uh, spokesman David Lappin, he gave an interview to Breibart today. And he said that the wall doesn't mean a single monolithic structure, but refers instead to a combination of walls, fences, and barriers complemented by a smart and effective use of technology, uh, which to me sounds pretty much like what we have now. Exactly. Uh, so that just kind of solidifies. The well, so he just made the built. existing wall great again. If you thought, if you ever thought there was going to be a wall, from, and I've said this from the very beginning, and Greg can verify this, you're a fucking idiot if you ever thought there was going to be a wall. <laughs> well, I already knew there was one, so we're good. <laughs> Problem solved. There was never going to be a wall. There is. No. It's just he didn't build it. The one around your heart does not count. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, just want to quarantine Bittner, okay? All right, Sarah. I don't care about you guys. Any amendments you would like to make to the uh, Spangle Lens plan? So I think the only question I would have about it in order to get completely on board is who gets to make that ideological decision as to what makes the right. perfect American mm -hmm. and what does that entail? Because I mean, right. right now our nation is like, we have tons of different types of people, tons of different types of ideas. And like, even in the libertarian party, we have people who that's have exactly what I was going to say of different ideas. Oh, I'm, you going, that? So, I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to assemble a team to put this test together <laughs> to, de to decide purity. I'm going to get Roger Paxton. It's not about purity. I, it's I'm about a, explaining it. Can you I, explain it? I, I know, but I need, we need somebody to judge and we need a libertarian super team. So I'm going to get people who are libertarians who all agree. So I'm going to get Austin Peterson. I'm going to get Roger Paxton, going to get Jacob Hornberger, I'm going to get Bill Weld, 
I'm going to get Gary Johnson. <laughs> one man, one vote. We're going to everybody gets together and we're going to create a team of like minded individuals that decide. Oh, let's let's add let's add Lou Rockwell and and uh, David Bowes in there too. So <laughs> everybody will agree. You got the spectrum right. <laughs> yeah. So that that's that's my definition of of well, society. I mean, we, we already is, do that anyway, though, because yeah. it's you know it's still an organization, an agency, and a bureaucracy who gets their uh, authority from the people. You know, and there is no. There is no divine council or, you know, there is no framework. You know, it isn't like a city council, Mm -hmm. but there definitely is already a system in place. But that's why it is tougher when it's ideological. And I don't necessarily care that you believe that libertarianism is the way, the path, the light right out of the gate. I more so care that you're able to explain the difference in something because that means you actually have read it. You understand the nuance. Mm -hmm. And then I would expect it to be wildly self-evident why constitutional protections are superior to just the will of the people. Right. If you can't grasp that, you know what, I'll let you stay. But I think that would appeal to the majority. Like That would be so self-evident to anyone that fully understood it. But how many college students know that, you know, the way the government works here and still want it to work a different way, even though they already know how it works. Right. So it's like, okay, they, we well, we know it. we know this is a good thing, but we want this instead. See, I don't think they can explain why. I think they know that checks and balances is good. Mm-hmm. You know, the three branches of government, you know, Bill of Rights. They know what's in it, but they have no frame of reference to compare it to of why it's superior. Okay. Uh, even if you graduated from college in political science, so many yeah. would not have that nuanced understanding. But they know all about it, what happened. Mm-hmm. All right, so that is our final thought on immigration. I'm glad that we have solved that. Uh, if you felt <laughs> that that was helpful, then please share that uh, with your friends so they can, they can understand what a, a sensible immigration policy would look like. Uh, and if you have any thoughts, please, editor at wearelibertarians.com. So let's move on to the president's tax reform. President uh, Trump was in Indianapolis on Wednesday, yesterday, uh, September 26th, here in Indianapolis at the state fairgrounds. And uh, obviously Mike Pence was our governor. He is from Columbus, about an hour south of here, and this is his hometown. Uh, I never got an answer why they uh, chose Indianapolis to do this tax plan. Any idea why? It's a, I, I really they knew that it would be a packed house with Mike Pence as vice president. Right. And, it, they, and Abdul would be there. They pack, <laughs> they packed the house with regular people. Basically, the entire state party of the Republican Party was there. And uh, none supported Trump. In right. The primary. Exactly. And they had they had originally decided to hold it at the Palladium in Carmel. And Carmel is the richest city in Indianapolis. It is just right. Uh, 20 minutes north of the the city center here in Indianapolis. And Carmel is also one of the highest tax-rated cities. Uh, So obviously a lot of wealthy people, a lot of taxes there, and they have done so much spending (laughs) as a city that they have bonded out a massive amount of money in Carmel. Can I interrupt real quick? Mm -hmm. Did you hear about the carousel in Carmel? No. Oh, my gosh. The mayor, Jim Brainerd, is the mayor up there. He wanted to use some of those funds that they were getting to kind of revitalize a certain part of the city to get a vintage carousel. Mm -hmm. And they said, "Um, no, we're not putting that in the paperwork. That's not going to be something that we can do because it's not going to be something that's like, what's the point? Justify that is for the public good. (laughs) Exactly. And so he's like, well, we'll find a way to do it. They have this arts district, and the arts district is very nice, but they have like three – Big arches that each cost a million dollars. The yeah. Palladium is this beautiful it's place. It's a great venue. It's yeah. a great venue, but it was built with taxpayer money, and it's huge, and it's just like this big uh, performing arts center. And all the local Republicans kind of went, prefer if you didn't have it in the middle of Whitey Town. So they put it at the state fairgrounds, which I saw President Bush speak there. Trump, we went to Trump's rally. We went to Trump's rally there. The state fairgrounds obviously are owned by the state, so they had the space. And it's in the middle of the hood. It's uh, a plighted area. It's a plighted area. Uh, but, but they love him. You know, what do they have to lose? That's what he said during the campaign. Black people love Donald Trump. So, uh, <laughs> Omarosa works for him. So he on Wednesday he unveiled a framework for tax reform. And it's not one big bill, but it's building off of work done by the so-called big six. You may hear this term. And that is a group of top tax policymakers 
Uh, I'm getting this information from the uh, Vox.com explainer, the new Republican tax plan explained, updated today, September 27, 2017. Uh, And uh, (laughs) if you read the Vox article, there is, oh, it's just seething with, all this money's just going to the top 1%. (laughs) So like I said last episode, Vox is great at laying things out, but they are also liberal. So be careful. Um, The so-called Big Six, a group of top tax policymakers in the Trump administration, Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin, National Economic Council Director Gary Cohn, the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, and Finance Committee uh, Chair Orrin Hatch, and the House Speaker Paul Ryan, and Ways and Means Committee Chair Kevin Brady. Ways and Means is the committee uh, that... Controls all the spending. That's so, the one you want if you ever get elected to Congress. Right, because you control the purse of your state house or your uh, Congress. So uh, it's not a big bill, but it, it's different pieces, and it's not all put together. But Donald Trump put laid out several different things, including uh, radically cutting corporate taxes, including totally exempting income earned overseas from taxation, to collapse individual tax rates to three or maybe four, they're not sure yet, brackets from seven and radically expand the standard deduction and child tax credits for individuals. So, Greg, what, what's, what's stuck out to you? Well, it's, it's, it's not so much a plan as it is a framework for what his goal is. And Explain it, what a framework means. So a framework is our, what are we trying to accomplish with the tax code? Why does it suck? It sucks because even though we have the high, you know, one of the highest corporate tax rates in the world, None of the corporations that are publicly traded pay any taxes because they carve out lobbying. Uh, you know, they're able to avoid, like Facebook pays 2%, Google. They pay 1% because there's this loophole called the double, du- I think it's like the double Dutch loophole where they buy an Irish company and do a corporate inversion and they pay 1% on their taxes. Mm-hmm. And so he's trying to eliminate deductions, loopholes. So it's about getting rid of all the carve outs and then simplifying the number of levels. Because the point is you wouldn't need all of these different rates and different um, tiers if we just made it where we had three. Ideally, you'd only want two. Or for me personally, I wish we just had one flat tax, applicable applicable across the board, no deductions for anything. Mm -hmm. We're all in this together. We all pay the same rate. No one's better. No one's worse. Mm -hmm. You know, and that would be my ideal. That isn't politically achievable. That's every bit as much of a utopia as private courts. So he did. They've released a framework where they think they can drive it past, where it will be revenue neutral because they'll be eliminating all of the deductions. They're also using some budget gimmickry, gimmickry to make it, uh, you know, be able to sell this. But it isn't going to look like this anyway. And so all they're trying to do is simplify the tax code. Actually, you know, realistically, they're going to get more corporate revenue by lowering tax rates because you're not incentivizing them to spend uh, the the, corp- the Fortune 500 spend 200 billion annually on accounting alone right. to try to pay minimize their taxation, yeah. which they're doing a great job of. So if you give it to where they don't have to spend $200 billion, you're, ben- you're essentially giving them a tax cut of $200 billion, and they'll gladly pay $125 billion. They'll take the $75 billion in savings. And that's the whole premise of all of this. Flatten, simplify, and then we don't have to spend so much even time even on the IRS compliance. Yeah. You know, the reason it's basically accounting and uh, tax attorneys – are a WPA for white people. Mm -hmm. The more laws you pass, the more accounting standards and all of this, the more demand you create for people that went to law school and people that have CPAs. The the audits are really to check your deductions anyways. I mean, mean, mean for personal people, but a lot of it's forensic accounting to catch corporate fraud. Right. You know, and they have the best people imaginable, and they, you know, do it all off the books on the golf course. So when – and Brian, if if you don't know this, then I'm sure Greg or I can answer it, but – So you're going to hear a lot of progressive tax versus regressive tax. The left is going to attack this as a regressive tax. In comparison to the existing one. So can you explain kind of – can you break down the difference between regressive and progressive taxes? So the regressive tax is essentially – and please jump in correct me if I'm wrong – is the mindset that it's going to end up uh, taking away from the lower – income earners it's the premise um, that every for, dollar for someone poor actually means more than a dollar to someone rich right and right. and it's also it's it's the language being used is that it's progressive if we have the rich paying more taxes they can afford it's, to they have a great life it's regressive but the if rich it's, don't pay taxes anyway right yeah. that's the thing is the right. rich with the pro yeah with a progressive tax of like the idea that if you're going to pay more 
as you get more money versus where <laughs> is if your income decreases, then you're going to your rate isn't going to increase. Like it, it's just it's so back ass word. If you right. know what I mean, and the deductions uh, are the, it, it, are why all of this takes place. Exactly, and, and like that's the thing is that I, mean, I I'm all for this this you know entire tax proposal to like at the very least start a framework to have a discussion to start lowering some taxes. Um, but number one, I'm just I'm very very nervous that it's not going to get rid of the loopholes like it says it's going to because right. right now the the, the document's nine pages. And we all know it's going to be like a hundred and hundred of pages uh, by the time it's all well and done. Um, but number two, I'm just I'm not optimistic that um, we're going to to see the loopholes closed. I just I I have a, a sneaky suspicion. I mean, when you have Mnuchin there is the Treasury Secretary um, who's from Goldman Sachs. Like it, it's just it's there's so much of this establishment progressive Republican uh, fingers on it. I just I have a bad feeling about it. Sarah, did you read it? Which part? I mean, you've got to be worried about it because it kind of changes the way joint filers have to go about it. Yeah, I mean, the married... I mean, it's going to affect you. It's going to affect married couples. Mm-hmm. Your taxes aren't going to be, yeah. you know, quite as simple. Joint filers, there's more things to account for. Yeah, well, and I realize being married has a lot of really good uh, perks to it, yeah. tax-wise. Yeah, like boners, it's in- it's right, in- Sarah? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> boners. Where's the payoff for her on that? No, <laughs> well, I... She I'm- can't win that. <laughs> Well, honestly, no, I'm talking about one of my coworkers was recently divorced and she didn't realize, oh, shoot, like now <laughs> my taxes just completely changed. And so they started taking out like it ended up being almost like two hundred fifty dollars a month oh, more yeah. because she got screwed over. And well, if taxes she quit living in sin, she'd get the break. Right. It's very sad. We have an anti spinster bias. <laughs> an anti spinster bias. <laughs> you get a spinster tax if you're unwed <laughs> over the age of 37. Do you get another tax for the more cats you have, too? No, they actually, you, it's capped on how much you can write off for cat food. Oh, okay. Yeah, you can. Yeah, what I, is ri- it? I write it off, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> that and your scented uh, uh, firewood and your premium bags from Menards. Why do you think that I mentioned mittens on the show? Yep, it's a business <laughs> expense. Get to write it all off. Exactly. There you go. I'm all just the kidding. Toys. I'm just kidding. I don't pay taxes. <laughs> <laughs> He's a real libertarian. Right. <laughs> no, but I mean. The, Come the, move over, Irwin. I'm moving in, Mr. That, Schiff. Any, any, any tax reform has to start from the idea of, well, what are we at right now? Yeah. And it's shit. Yeah. We have arguably, we have the highest corporate tax rate in the world with the lowest amount of collections you could possibly imagine from the 1% of the corporation, the multinationals. Right. So that is yep. the flaw. That isn't even progressive. Like Rand Paul's plan of a 15% flat tax, general business tax, just flat across the board, home interest deduction and the earned income tax credit for people trying to move up the socioeconomic ladder. That got crushed as racist. Right. What do you you're going to charge a billionaire the same as someone working at Walmart? Do you have no soul? And that isn't even remotely the way the argument should take place. Because Mitt Romney was able to only pay 12% in, in uh, personal income taxes because he had access to the carried interest deduction, which allows you to carry forward losses from uh, capital gains. And so he had $240 million stuffed away in a Cayman Island IRA, and it was totally legal because it had been carved out for donors. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, so I mean, it's yep. just, it's absurd the way these things are framed and set up because progressive act like, they act like if we collected the way that it was designed with all, with all, without all the carve outs, it would be insane amount of revenue boom to mm-hmm. the government. Yeah, so I'm going to I'm gonna breeze through some of the highlights and then we'll get Brian's take on what he thinks uh, of the, the tax rate. And we're going to dive deeper into some of this stuff next week. But we wanted to give you an informed view of what he, what he talked about. So the seven current individual tax brackets will be consolidated to 3, 12, 25, and 35%. Uh, they may add a fourth bracket above 35, um, trying to keep it progressive. Standard deduction will be raised to 24000 for couples like Jer and Sarah. And 12000 The morals. The right. $12,000 for individuals uh, like myself and Greg, near doubling from current levels. A child tax. Well, no, Brian and, and I are the, married. Uh, Screw you. All right. I was going to say, and, I'll say, and the AMT goes away too. That's the huge one. That is huge because yeah, that is basically huge. a catch all. So you might very well get a bunch of deductions at your income level and you mm-hmm. only have to pay a certain amount. That's like a second out of, you know, secret tax rate coming in and saying, not right. so fast. Yeah. Uh, and, the, and so for those who don't know, the AMT is the alternative minimum tax. 
So essentially what happens is if you are earning more than $130,000 uh, or if you're a married couple that makes over $160,000, you have an additional tax. So that is all going away. Um, that's that, like Greg said, that's huge. Uh, yeah. And, uh, the estate and gift tax, the most progressive component of the tax code is abolished. A child tax credit currently a thousand dollars will grow to an unspecified higher level. It will also be expanded to more households, uh, currently phases out at 75 and there for single and uh, 110,000 for married couples. So when Jer and Sarah have their baby <laughs> in 10 months, uh, listen, I'm giving you a month to get married and then, uh, Babies right after that. Um, <laughs> a clan, some might say. A big okay. a big kitchen table. You're going to have a lot of kids. An increased child, child, Six. Mm-hmm. An increased child tax credit that will help uh, offset the cost of child care. The personal exemption currently offering households $4,050 per person. And standard deductions deduction. is eliminated by the higher child credit and standard deductions. So breeders are getting a favorable tax rate, which is <laughs> bullshit. Which, no, and that comes, comes into, like, the population problem. Right. You mm-hmm. know, it's all designed off of the idea to keep whites in power. Okay. <laughs> keep them breeding and then keep them in control right. of writing the tax code. The corporate income tax rate will be lowered to, from 35 to 20%, which is great because we don't believe in business taxes because it's, it's double, du- taxation. double taxation. Right. You're paying with taxed mm-hmm. money to a corporation that then is paying tax. It's, it should be zero. Mortgage interest rates and charitable deductions would remain, but almost all other tax deductions would go. Uh, the corporate tax will be territorial. Um, we won't get into that. It's too, too in the weeds. Um, Basically, that's his plan for, you know, put America corporations first, you know, level the playing field. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, companies could immediately expense all their investments instead of the depreciative investments. Um, it would last five years but might go away after that, trying to spur growth. Companies would face a limit on how much debt they can deduct Pass-through companies, which Greg talked about, would pay a lower 25% rate than the top individual rate. And two existing credits for corporations, the R&D tax credit and the low-income housing credit, won't be repealed. So, overall, Brian, what did you think of this plan? I think it's definitely a good first step. And two things with regards to the business taxes that are getting cut. Um, number one, with regards to the the, uh, the big business corporate taxes, uh, one thing that's really significant about the tax being cut from 35% to 20% is that the 20% rate is actually just below um, the average tax rate of major developed countries that we're competing against uh, on an economic standpoint. So it really does give us a competitive advantage, um, not only uh, in America, when we have American made goods that are going to be able to be on equal footing with our, our foreign goods that are being brought in, but also on an international scale, we can start to hopefully uh, trade more and more because now our tax rate is going to lower the cost of our goods. Uh, so again, the, the marketplace is going to help out. And then one thing with the uh, the small business tax too, um, so the 25% rate is huge. Um, but then one caveat that was also uh, put in was that if you're a small business and you get very little income in a year, um, you can actually have an option to pay a 12% rate instead. Um, so again, that would be really helpful for small business. Um, but overall, I mean, like I said, this is a great first step. Uh, right now we have such an inflated tax system and, and there's so many nuances. I mean, you have to be an accountant just to figure out, um, your own personal taxes, mm-hmm. um, accounting, but also art. it creates That's a- how complex it is. Like it, it's Absolutely. become art. If you're, like if you can, if you're, if you're, if you're that good and creative, you can make it say anything you want. Exactly. And if, that's the thing. If you're a corporation, you have such a competitive advantage to other small mom and pop shops because you have <laughs> fleets of lawyers and accountants who can go through the tax code and find these loopholes that then give you a competitive advantage unfairly against your competitors because they just don't have the means to hi- have those accountants and lawyers that go through it themselves to find the same advantages. So it, it's almost like a, a, a tax code that incentivizes uh, cronyism. So if we – if Trump stays to his word, which I do have obvious reservations about, this would help create so much more competition within our own borders, um, but then you know, take that step further and really give us a stronger uh, competitive advantage or just at the very least on equal footing with our international uh, partners. 
Sarah, what do you? What is your thought of the plan? Um, just from what I read about it, making those simplifications makes a big deal. Um, just I are I do my own taxes at this point because I'm single. I don't have any deductions or anything crazy. <coughs> Final year. <sighs> we'll see. Stop um, your feet. <laughs> I'm upset. Where's my but, rock? <laughs> I want something blue and borrowed too. <laughs> oh my goodness, you guys. We're engagement shaming. We should. <laughs> Uh, we white males. Should I just like hold Cis my hand lords? up like this the whole time? So yes. So you can see there's not one. Uh, one I don't know why there. you took that drink out of your hand. You should just had it like this at the camera the whole time. <laughs> the whole time. No, but I think simplifying the process is a is a good thing. And having, you know, where people can understand exactly what they're doing with their taxes and not and knowing where their money's going, I think, is a huge deal. And as a libertarian, if you know where your money's going and exactly how much is going to specific areas, that makes it a lot easier for you to feel okay about, you know, yeah, they're stealing from me, but. Right. I mean, if we didn't have automatic withholding <laughs> and you had to send the government the money you owed at the end of the year, <laughs> we would have the ultimate libertarian society. There would be no money yep. Yep. for the actual government, <laughs> yeah. the administration of government functions. Because Americans spend. <laughs> right, but because they get to hold on to it, in, you know, since they're so kind. Right. Yes. And then send you back a rebate. You know, go buy a oh, TV. Oh, you guys should go get this really nice TV you were looking exactly. at. Exactly. Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and do that patio project? <laughs> you know, that's, that's, it's so ridiculous. Like, if you really wanted to fix, you wanted to get to the libertarian, you know, push toward a libertarian society. Stay, you know, make that your goal. No more automatic withholding as a party. Mm-hmm. All right, I am tired of hearing myself talk, so I can't imagine how the listeners feel after like <laughs> literally two to six, seven hours of me this week. Oh, that's right. Yeah, between the four podcasts, uh, so <laughs> I, that's a lot of me. I don't even spend that much time with myself. That's beyond propaganda. Yes. So, uh, and we'll do it all again next week. Four? <laughs> uh, no, d- no, and three hours next week. We're doing only three. No Jen Gray. No Jen Gray. No. <laughs> no. We did a little Hitler ep- Hitler's lessons for <laughs> libertarians on Jen Gray for, to fill in for her and help her out. Yeah. So Jen, uh, Jen is going through it. A rough period doing a lot of traveling, and so we decided that uh, we would uh, commandeer her podcast, Leading Liberty. So Greg and I are – We did something we'd always wanted to talk about and did all the the, potential blowback on somebody else. Exactly right. We had the perfect fall guy. It's not her podcast, not ours. Yeah, Larry Sharp will never get any criticism. It'll be fine. It'll 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 uh, come out today or tomorrow. I think it'll be tomorrow when when this episode will come out. So by the time you hear this, then you can go download it at Leading Liberty. Go check it out. Uh, the first episode was why you should podcast, and we take you into all the benefits that we've experienced in doing this podcast. Second episode is how to podcast, and we give you all the dirt on how to, we run this, including all the equipment and all the good stuff there. And then uh, the third episode is how... I got to pick that one. Yeah, guess what Greg picked. If you were to guess what Greg picked, Sarah. I already know what he picked because I've listened to the other two. Go ahead and... But he would have picked something that has to do with Hitler. Right, of that's course. right. So I decided to focus on the positive. Right. So we did Hitler's <laughs> Lessons him. for Libertarians. Hit- oh, okay. Hitler's Lessons for Libertarian on the book <laughs> Selling Hitler. Mm-hmm. And uh, we talked about li- Hitler, Hitlerian propaganda and how we can apply it to libertarians. Where there's some overlap. Common right. ground, if you will. <laughs> I mean, yeah. If, common ground, some lavish father. Yeah. What a, the you know. leg room, you know. Yeah, we need some leg room to grow. Right. So, Liberty, the tree of liberty sometimes needs need more some soil, some soil to grow. So, but, yes, and it might – never mind. I know. Uh, so, <laughs> Don't go Cantwell ever. Right. Uh, I'm not going to go full Jeff Diest. Uh, mm-hmm. So – Okay, so walk. <laughs> <laughs> so check those out. Uh, they're really good episodes. If you are a paid subscriber, you've already heard those episodes, except for the Hitler one, which you you have uh, you will get next week. Uh, you may have already gotten. I don't know. I've, I've uploaded too much stuff, uh, so you may have already gotten that in your feed, and you will get the raw, uncut version, commercial free, no introductions, high quality audio in your feed. Uh, if you are a paid subscriber at five dollars a month, Sarah, you are a paid paying member of the uh, subscription service. What do you think? I love it right now because I get all a lot of the other stuff that I was missing before. Right. So like getting what? getting the extra, you know, before and after the show, kind of the stuff that happens, and then. I hate commercials on podcasts, so I generally – it used to be I would just skip the first two minutes and 30 seconds of your podcast. Right. Because that's when they, you had all the ads, which that's how I found some libertarian podcasts in the past, but 
It's the same ones over and over again. It's the same thing on every other podcast you listen to. So it's like, okay, they don't just have skip Hitler's through. lessons for libertarians. I can guarantee that. They right. don't, but it, like uh, the advertising is the same. It so is. right. Listen and then, to the Johnny Rocket Launchpad. Yeah, and then listen to the Boss Hog of Liberty. <laughs> yeah, that she's one's on literally there too. advocating skipping her own podcast. Right. Now. <laughs> right. That whole little uh, promo you read just right out the window. Right. But no, and then it's fun just to interact with other people too. So being able to be in on the group where you can watch the podcast live. That's yeah. a ten dollar a month, right? Yep. Yes. That- Dear Leaders Court, you get Leaders Court. access to a Facebook group. You get uh, on Tuesdays and Thursday night to interact with everybody while it happens. Yeah. He'll do anything if you tip. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> By he'll, he, he, you mean Stone Aldridge? Uh, yes, yes, correct. that's the one. So, so, yeah, so I'm glad you're enjoying it. Yes, I think it's worth the extra $3 a month that I spend now. Yeah, so check it out at wearelibertarians.com. <laughs> wearelibertarians.com on Patreon. You can join there. Uh, so final thoughts for the episode, Brian, give us your final thoughts, anything that you want to self promote and anything that you missed during the episode. Two things. Number one, uh, Trump did a really good thing and he nominated, uh, Texas, uh, libertarian, just well, mm-hmm. libertarian minded justice, uh, Don Willette to the U S appellate court there in the fifth circuit. Uh, so that's good. Uh, number two, I yours truly was one of the few who was selected by Twitter to get the 280 character tweet uh, for their beta test. I toot my own horn. So if you want to check out what a 280 tweet not looks us, we're like, alphas. We <laughs> yeah, don't follow me. Tests. We're not betas like you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but no, seriously, follow me on Twitter. It's at B Nichols Liberty. I always love new followers. So. Check out the 280 tweet, and you can see what not to do when you have a 280 tweet, too. (laughs) This is the worst idea ever. Giving libertarians access to more characters. Is... Walls of text. <laughs> you want to know what's even worse? Jeff Vibbert got the I got the extra. That. Well, so. that's just going to be more depressing content. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> my life's so terrible. Isn't oh. my dog pretty? <laughs> oh, I only get to fuck tens. <laughs> Asshole. <laughs> uh, Sarah Potter, any final thoughts for you? Um, I think just in general... Um, my final thought for this episode, I always like to promote my Libertarian Party of Morgan County. We are having our monthly meeting on October 12th. I but you're leaderless. Well, you know, we're going to we're gonna try really hard. You know, Danny and I have got it pretty good right now as far as trying to figure out what we're doing fundraising-wise. We've got some new people starting to come, so that's exciting. Um, but we have it every month at Ralph and Ava's in Mooresville, Indiana. It's this nice little cafe, local business. They have beer, they have wine, they have whatever. They have food that's fantastic. And on top of that, we have a piano guy that comes every Thursday and does, um, it's kind of like at Howl at the Moon, which is like a piano bar where there's somebody playing piano and he sings and it's a lot of fun. So we usually do kind of our business part first just to get it out of the way. And then after the business in the front, part in the back. (laughs) We are mullets. Um, So that's going to be my next podcast. We are mullets. I love it. You can have Bittner on to talk about his mullet. Welcome to the Libertarian Party of Kentucky. Yes. You are in Morgan County, which is the perfect place to have a mullet podcast. Yes, but we do our business first and then generally we just hang out, eat, um, listen to the piano guy. He's really great. His name's Todd Baldwin. Um, but that's the only thing I have to promote. Um, final thoughts wise, though. Only, only thing she has to promote. Only thing. That's yeah. It. The other part I did already. I know. I I'm already kidding. paid Was there my congratulations dues. Congratulations in order? No. Okay. No. Um, but the other thing I think is just whenever people are talking about some of these issues, sometimes they don't use any common sense whatsoever. And so just being able to kind of talk about those issues and say things like, you know, exactly how it's going to work and you see this is going to be a problem this is what's going to happen i mean some people just don't think about that they think about certain they have a certain thought process because what they're doing is they're following you know they read it people. on a bumper sticker exactly and that's they, something they that's just like liberty viral can you or just something. can you just like think about it for a second and think it, about it, how it that's now, going to now. affect you no, I know. Um, so it I think amazes that's me. a big thing now is, like, just use your common sense when you're talking about these issues. People have no idea, like, how to anticipate what the result of something's going to be. Right. I mean, it always shocks me. It's like, you realize that if you are very <laughs> restrictive on immigration, all of a sudden you can't fund Social Security. Uh, all of a sudden. Oh, sorry. I thought, my, <laughs> I thought my mute button was on. Sorry about that. <laughs> and I was just getting ready to say you could push boomers actually literally off a cliff. And <laughs> that was his, you know, the perfect. Set up for him to knock out of the park, and he belches. And it was like, 
a dinosaur in Jurassic Park. It's like I, that one that shoots, spits at Newman. So I got, I got, I got mute buttons for us because you know we talked about that. And mine, you got to really, really press it down, or it's not going to work. And I am sorry, I didn't press it hard enough. <laughs> oh, you can only get. Three dollar monthly subscription mute button. What did right. you expect? Right. They came from Hong Kong. <laughs> These are rolls. These are very nice, but I think I might have a malfunction. So that's what I'll blame it on. <laughs> <laughs> God, I literally feel like I have black tar in my face and like a a neck skirting came out from his head of his head. That was hot too. As you, as you said, as you here in Philly, as you yeah. <laughs> As you said it, as you said to Maya one time, which is on our on our SoundCloud still. Ah, oh, that was that had the heat of a fart and the smell of a fart. <laughs> the meatball was too spicy. All right, good. it's a spicy meatball. Greg, final thoughts? No, I mean, what else can be said? What else? What else? Can be said? What can possibly be said after this? I mean, it's not the first time I belched in the mic. I farted in the mic too. It's... You have, but that was when Bittner was here, and you just triggered me back to Bittner. <laughs> <laughs> Do I still want to throw in the Rio Grande off the wall? I mean, I had a really good fart one time, and I had to share it with the audience. You did. It was great. And then you ate a chicken sandwich into the microphone for four minutes <laughs> while he had just disgusting. found out he was diabetic. Oh. That was so gross. And so, then just sip your sweet I think tea. I fast-forwarded through that part, too. <laughs> Bittner, Bittner found out he was diabetic, and this is the type of friend I am. I invited him on my podcast. <laughs> I went to Chick Fil A, his favorite restaurant, and ordered a sweet tea, his favorite drink, and a chicken sandwich, which he couldn't have and he loves. And then I sat there, stared him straight in the eye, and ate it on the air in front of his face. You did. And then I <laughs> <laughs> made everyone else. You held us hostage, audio hostages. Well, here's the thing, like Bittner, we do the never Bittner thing, but like the episodes with Bittner are always some of the funniest. You bully him. <laughs> in ways that are so grade school, it just makes me so happy inside. You you need to you go, give them willies like on air. You you go to our go to wall w a l dot fireside dot f m and go to the do go to the hosts and click Brett Bittner and go listen to all the Brett Bittner episodes. The homeschool one where oh. I was drunk on ginger beer and we had brought in a guy who actually homeschools his kids, great libertarian. <laughs> yes, and then Bittner considers himself an educational expert because for. You know, three days he was homeschooled. Well, he no was. public school would admit him. Is it like Jer, where he is the he's the expert on education because he's had public school, private school, and homeschool? Yes. What that is an expert he, on is being kicked out of things. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> and Bittner, well, Bittner served as on the school board. He got twice elected, right. re-elected to his school board in Marietta, which was no easy feat. So, I mean, he's. He's got some Especially for a kid like him. Exactly. You know, <laughs> he, turtles, he school boards at his own yeah, pace. He had that Kentucky waterfall waddling around with his ten, Ninja Turtles backpack. <laughs> that's where that's where uh, Bittnering at his own pace, Lil Brett Bittner. And yeah, the Air Bittners. All the that came Double from. strap Velcro shoes. All that came from that episode. The pacemakers. So good. All right. Uh, my final thought for, uh, for the episode. I want to point out an article uh, from Wonk Blog on uh, today, actually. Minorities and Americans without college degrees showed greatest gains in wealth since 2013, new data shows. And essentially, uh, it didn't narrow the uh, inequality gap, um, but African Americans, Hispanics, and people without college degrees saw large gains in net worth over the past three years. Um, I do not have a college degree. I went to IEPUI for four years trying to get a history degree. I got a comm minor to get a uh, to get an internship at a ran an AM radio station in 2004, and uh, that I worked there for four years and that launched my career and gave me a, all the opportunities from which we all benefit, both you and I, dear listener. So Abdul is actually responsible for your career uh, for me dropping out of college and my career. Wow, and, that's yeah. like a reverse of affirmative action. No, the two people that are most responsible for my career are Abdul and uh, and, and Mark Rutherford, um, and now Tom. Uh, so Tom Griswold. So yeah, I I and and I'll tell you, having dropped out. I worked way harder than I, – I had to hustle my ass off because not having a college degree made me more self-conscious and uh, as if I needed any more insecurities. <laughs> and uh, so <laughs> I just – you know what I needed to feel more insecure about my life? And so I 
I just started hustling, and it all started to pay off in the last couple of years. And I would imagine that uh, black folk and Mexicans and myself, we all share a kindred a- attitude where <laughs> we are we are disadvantaged. I hope everyone else is dying like I am. Right now. <laughs> black, folk. black folk. I am you. You are me. We are all the same. We are not like the white man with a college education. We had to work hard. And uh, we're not entitled like these lazy white boomer bastards, so we had to work a little harder. Now it's coming to fruition. So to to all of my black friends, (laughs) Harry, Abdul, (laughs) uh, and to all of my Mexican friends... I'm your Mexican brother for the purposes of the example today. I really need a Mexican friend. We need a Hispanic on this show. Well, you sent Joe back to Puerto Rico. I did. Wasn't yeah. very nice of you. <laughs> Joe Hurricanes self- notwithstanding. <laughs> no, 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 no. Joe self-deported after the election. Uh-huh. Okay, so, Mitt Romney. Yeah, so uh, we love Joe. We miss Joe. Uh, Hope San Juan's okay. But Joe, Joe was like, eh, I don't know what happened to these guys. I'm going back to church. So this is a little, little kind of a lot of Hitler. To- totally get it, Joe. Totally get it. All right. Thank Thanks for listening to this episode of We Are Libertarians. If you want more, then please subscribe at wearelibertarians.com and look for the Patreon button on the right. Or go to patreon.com slash wearelibertarians. Please subscribe. I want to thank our $100 a month subscribers. First and foremost, our super duper fan, Christy Avery. Craig uh, DaCosta, Jason Doolittle, you guys are so awesome. You guys uh, donate, which we cannot believe, $100 a month. And you guys, your generosity is so – we thank you so much. Our $25 a month, Carly Ernst just joined up. She's the best. Carly – She's not – you know, she's $75 less than our super-duper people. (laughs) You know, not that I'm counting. Right. Now, Carly put us over the edge. We are now at – Ten. Uh, we are now at a thousand dollars and si- that one thousand six dollars a month. Better work on your week stance. Which is, uh, I know, at ten <laughs> ten thousand dollars a month. I'm doing a full James Weeks. That's the hip flexibility you're going to need. Uh, Brandon Kester, Andre Myrick, Brantley Spicer, Joey Tanner, Heidi Aldridge, Christian Emmons, Dan Dunbar, Doug Stream, Chad Oakage, uh, Chris Christopher Brokenoff, and Todd Singer. Thank you guys for being twenty five dollar donors. Uh, our ten dollar donors. The list is getting so long. I will read you guys next episode. So thank you so much, uh, and everybody at the five and one dollar level. And, and and listen, if you just listen for free, thank you, thank you for make getting all the way to the end of this podcast. Thank you to Brian Nichols for hanging out with us. Uh, I hope Hey-o. that I uh, I appreciate you hanging in there with us. Uh, we love when you uh, come on, and we want to have you on a lot more. Uh, so hopefully we didn't ruin that tonight. And I can't wait to see <laughs> no, you, honey. I'm on, dude. Yeah, since we got gay married, <laughs> you got you got gay married to my Mexican <laughs> co-host. Uh, apparently, I go to Temple. Oh, <laughs> do they do gifts? I'll show you all around Philly. Great. Wedding. Yes, it's a brotherly love. Christy, Christy uh, uh, Avery. Mm-hmm. I did read your name. Christy it was like, I missed my name again. I went to the bathroom, so we did read your name. Uh, she always gets mad when she misses the live stream. I'm like, bro, we record it. Uh, so, <laughs> so thank you so much, Brian, for coming on. Yes. Uh, it's always great when you're on and, and Miss Moore. I mean, Miss Potter. I was getting there uh, to the. <laughs> so thank you, Brian, for coming on. Yeah, absolutely. Always right. a pleasure, buddy. Really enjoyed it. And Sarah Potter. Thanks. I hope you're a Potter not much longer. Uh, <laughs> who wants to be a Potter? Just walking around potting things. <sighs> so I get it. I or, mean, you know, creating things. Go- uh, good money in 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 uh, San Diego. Who wants to though work at that barn? What is what, San Diego? What? San Diego. <laughs> oh, we I'll gotta, tell you later. What it we got to end this. All right, yeah, Walt, Walt Wright is happening right now in front of our eyes. <laughs> Walt Wright. <laughs> thank you for joining us here on We're Libertarians. And as always, we promise to do better next time. <laughs> God, you're so tired. I am. Uh,